Today we're going to be building our own video streaming platform just like Netflix without writing a single line of code using a tool called Bubble. Now look, there's so much that I want to cover within this tutorial today, but before I say another word, let's dive in and take a preview of what we're going to be building. Over in a preview of our product, the first thing you'll notice is that we're required to create a new user account in order to access our Netflix product. And so what I'm going to do is type in my email and password here. And then when I click this button here, it's also going to prompt me to accept the monthly subscription payment for Netflix. And when I click subscribe, it's going to redirect me through to a Stripe checkout page where of course I can add in all of my credit card details and you'll see that we're going to be charged this amount per month. Once I add all of this information in and click on subscribe, I'm then going to be redirected to my home page. And of course, like the real world Netflix product, this is where you can see a long list of all of the content that's available to stream. And of course, all of this is broken down into separate categories here. If you also wanted, you could view a list of all of the dedicated TV shows or even all of the movies. And if you wanted to learn more about a particular piece of content, all you have to do is click on the thumbnail image. It's going to open this pop up here. And in this case, it's going to display a brief description about this show. If I wanted, I could choose to add this to my list and I can also scroll down and view a list of all of the episodes broken down into each individual season. What you'll also see here is that below this, we have a list of suggested content that's related to the genre of this piece of content. And most importantly, if we wanted to start streaming this, we could click on this episode and it's going to redirect us through to a page where, as you can see, we can start streaming the content of this episode. Now, if I was to switch things up and log in as an admin of our Netflix clone, what you'll see is that we have this backdoor menu where we can manage all of the content that's uploaded and published to our platform. And so right now I can see a long list of all of the shows and movies. And if I wanted to create a new piece of content, I could easily do that. But in this case, I just want to show you what it looks like when we edit a piece of content. So I'm going to select this button here. It's going to redirect us through to a dedicated page where we can edit any of the details. So we can update the type of content, the title, the description, the thumbnail image, even the genre. And because this piece of content is a TV show, what you'll then see is that we have the ability to manage all of the different seasons. So if you wanted to create a new season, you could add this in. Then if you scroll down to the bottom, you can start adding each individual episode into that season. So you can add things like the title of the episode, the description, the thumbnail once again, and of course the media file in which is going to be streamed. And look, aside from all of these features that I've walked through today, there's still a ton happening behind the scenes in order to power our entire Netflix clone. If you've ever wanted to build your own app or startup, I'm sure you know firsthand just how complicated it can be. Look, if you're a non-technical founder, just like this guy, your options are quite limited. You can either try and source a technical co-founder, which is honestly going to take you months to do and a whole lot of butt kissing, or you can pay an arm and a leg to get a developer to build it for you. And let me tell you right now, in this economy, that is the last thing I want to do. And so that is why Bubble is going to be your new best friend on your startup journey. Bubble is what's known as a no-code tool, which in simple terms just means that you can create fully functional apps without having to touch or write a single line of code. I've been using Bubble for years now and I've been able to build any app you could think of. Whether it be a marketplace, a social network, a matchmaking service, and anything in between, Bubble has got you covered. When it comes to no-code tools, Bubble is by far superior. Not only does it give you the ability to create your own custom database, but it allows you to design the entire interface of your app, stitch everything together using visual workflows, and of course, integrate with any third-party tool or service you could imagine. Now, each one of these would be a standalone no-code tool. So what I truly love is that Bubble includes all of this in one single platform. So instead of having to connect a whole bunch of different tools and services like Spaghetti, Bubble's got you covered. Look, by this point, I've rambled on for long enough. There's so much that I need to cover within this tutorial today. So why don't we grab our Bubble editor and we can dive right into it. Within our tutorial today, the very first thing we're going to do is not actually build out any core user-facing features, 
But instead, we're going to take the time to set up and configure our own custom database, which will be used to power the rest of our Netflix clone. Now look, when it comes to our tutorial today, what I've done is I've taken the time to list everything we're going to add into our database within a doc here. And I've also included a list of all of the features we're going to build out within our Netflix clone. So as you can see, it's quite an extensive list. Now, when it comes to creating this checklist of items, I like to use a tool called Notion. Notion's just a powerful note-taking tool that allows you to just build out things like checklists. So that way, as soon as you add something into your bubble editor, you can just check it off and it'll just help you keep track of where you are throughout the build. Now, of course, I'm going to be sure to include a link to my checklist within the description of this video. So that way you can also make a copy of this and follow along with me. But when it comes to our tutorial today, as I mentioned, the first thing we're going to cover here is the database structure. Now, there's two important things you need to know when you're building a database inside a bubble. And that is the difference between data types and data fields. And look, if you're brand new to bubble, everything I probably just said is complete jargon. And look, that's completely fine. It's my job today to simplify everything and explain it in terms that you can understand. So when it comes to your database, the very first thing you'll need to understand is what a data type is. A data type in your database is an overarching thing that you want to store. So for instance, if a user needs to register an account, you're going to need to store the information of a user in your database. And so what I like to do before I build anything out inside of my bubble editor is just take the time to sit down and think of all of the different data types that we need to add. Now, the easiest way to determine what should be a data type inside of your app is just by thinking about everything that a user will need to create. So a data type is an overall entity or a thing and your users are the people who will create them. So you can see here in my checklist, my data types are the headings above all of the checklist items. And if we were to scroll down this list quickly, I just want to explain my rationale behind each data type. So if I have to think about everything that a user needs to create inside of our app, the very first thing is a user account. So whenever someone wants to register for our app, they're going to have to sign up and create an account. Now by default, Bubble will create a user data type for you. And I'll show you that in a moment, but we will need a user data type. The next thing we'll need to create is a piece of content. And so when it comes to a piece of content, this could either be a movie or a TV show. Essentially, it's just like a piece of media. And so today I'm going to refer to that as a piece of content. So anytime I say content, I'm just referring to a TV show or a movie, as I mentioned. And look inside of your app today, your users aren't going to be the people who actually create this content. However, you as the admin will have a special user account, which will allow you to upload movies or TV shows. And every time you upload a piece of media or a piece of content, we're going to create a new entry in our database. And then from here, this is where things might get a little bit confusing. And look, I do have to be honest, when it came to building out my Netflix clone, this was probably one of the harder databases I had to configure. So please don't be stressed if this overwhelms you in the beginning. I assure you that when we actually go to build out the app, it's going to make much more sense. But for now, I do just want to give you a brief introduction into how we've set up our database. So within each piece of content, as I mentioned, it could either be a movie or a TV show. And if it is a TV show, what I'd like to do is store a list of all of the seasons within that TV show. So inside of each TV show, we're going to create a bunch of different seasons and these will be linked back to each other. And so a TV show could have multiple seasons and they'll be stored within our pieces of content. So you can start to see how our database is going to be like one of those little Russian dolls where you just continually pull out all of the different layers. Everything today is going to be intertwined and connected together. And then of course, inside of each season, what we're going to do is create a series of episodes. And so because you're going to create and upload an episode, this is going to be its own data type. And then finally, I have a separate data type, which is known as my movie content. And the sole purpose as to why I've created this separate data type is going to actually lead me into my next point that I need to cover. And that is what data fields are. So inside of each data type, you might see that there's this checklist of all of these different items. And these are going to be referred to as my data fields. So for every item that's created in my database, I'm going to want to store some information about that. And perhaps the best example is just by scrolling up to my user data type. So for every user account that someone registers, I'd like to store some information about that user. So their name, their profile photo, a list of all of the bookmarks that they saved to their list, as well as a profile type. So are they a normal user or are they an admin? And so all of this information is the fields within my data type. And look, when it comes to data fields, 
If I'm storing large bits of information, so particularly things like lots of images or files, I try to avoid storing them all under the same data type. And what do I mean by that? So if we were to look at this content data type here, so once again, this is either a TV show or a movie. Within this data type, you can see we have quite a few different items. So we've got things like the title of that piece of content, the thumbnail image, the description, a rating, a genre, and so on. And so every single time Bubble needs to load a piece of content, it's going to automatically load every single data field that sits inside of this data type. And so if you have lots of information stored within one data type, your application might start to slow down as Bubble's going to need more time to load all of that information, particularly if you're storing things like files, because files are normally large bits of data. Sometimes they're often gigabytes. So it takes time for your application to grab that information from your database and then display it. And so what I like to do is when I have large data fields, so things like files, which is what you'll see here for my movie content, is that I like to break these away from the main data type. Because by default, we don't actually always need to load the file of a piece of content until someone actually wants to start streaming it. So if you think about Netflix on the homepage, there's normally a long list of all of the potential pieces of content that you could watch, whether it be movies or TV shows. And if we're loading, let's say 100 pieces of content that we just wanna to display to our users, it's going to load every single data field for that piece of content multiplied by 100 times because there's 100 pieces of content. And so if we were to then start loading the files for 100 different pieces of content, Bubble's really gonna have a hard time loading all of those files at once because it needs to read the information of all of those files. And so that is why I've split this into a separate data type. And this is something I'll often do within my tutorials. If I'm storing lots of information that's quite heavy to load for your database, you can break that off into its own data type and then you can create a link between these two data types. And once again, I know that might sound a little bit confusing if you are brand new to Bubble, but look, when I actually add all of these data fields into my database, it's gonna make a lot more sense. And so when it comes to our database, we're gonna jump over into Bubble and open up our data tab. And what you might notice is that this is broken down into two different signs. On the left-hand side here, you have your list, which is your data types. So this is where you're going to add all of the overarching things that are going to be created inside of your app. And then on the right hand side here, you have all of your data fields. So these are all of the fields for our user data type. And of course, as I mentioned before, by default, Bubble is already going to create a user data type for you. And the reason for that is of course, users won't be able to log in and use your app unless they have an account. So that's why Bubble adds this by default. Now, what you'll also notice is that under your user data type, you have a couple of different data fields that have been pre-created. So there's the email field here, because of course, when someone signs up for your app, they're gonna need to add an email and a password. Now, something I should also point out is that Bubble will automatically create a password data field. You just won't be able to see it in plain text here for privacy reasons, but it has been created. You don't need to create a password field on your own. And so what we're gonna do when it comes to structuring our database is just start by adding in all of my data types. So if we jump into our Notion checklist here, we've already added our user data type, and then I'm gonna add my content data type. And look, there's a reason why I haven't added all of my data fields into my user data type before I move down my list. And the reason for that is because what you might notice soon is that some data fields link to separate data types. So in a good example, if I wanted to link my movie file from my movie content data type to an actual piece of content itself, we're gonna have a data field here, which is known as the movie file. And this is going to be linked to the separate data type. And so because we might need to reference different data types in a moment, we need to first of all, create those data types. So we're going to then jump back into our bubble editor and we're going to add in the content data type. I'll choose to create this. Then there was the data type for our season. So as I mentioned, when we wanna create TV seasons, we're gonna to have to create these as an individual data type. Now, one thing I should point out as well while we're here is that you might notice that I haven't added any plurals to my data types. So this is season, not seasons. And the reason for that is although we are gonna have multiple seasons stored within our database, we're only gonna create one season at a time. So if you start using plurals here, it might get confusing when you go on to create those items you wanna store in your database. So I'd strongly advise that you don't use plurals when it comes to the actual data types. From here though, the other data type I wanna add is the episode. 
And then there was another data type known as the movie content. And that is all of the actual data types that we need to add in within this section of our database. Now from here, typically what we then do is build out all of the data fields that sit inside of each data type. But of course, just when you thought you were getting the hang of things, I'm gonna throw another curveball in the mix. And look, I promise you, this is going to be valid. I wouldn't do this unless it was completely necessary. And what do I mean by this? Today, I'm also gonna introduce you to the concept of option sets. So if I was to scroll on down through my database list here, below my data types, I've also built out this list here known as option sets. And you can see that these are structured just like data types with data fields. But of course, what on earth is an option set? Look, option sets in Bubble are a slightly more intermediate feature, but they are very powerful. Option sets kind of function like data types, only the information is pre-created in your database. And so once again, what on earth did I just say? I'm sure it was just a bunch of jargon. Let's wind it back and take a look at our data types once again. So when it comes to a data type, as I mentioned, this is information that's going to be created on the fly. So whenever a user signs up for your app, you're gonna create a new user account and you're gonna store all of their information. When it comes to a piece of content, you as the admin will probably log in and you'll create a new piece of content on the fly. So whether it be a movie or a TV show, no two pieces of content are going to be the same. And so that is the purpose of data types. If something is not going to be the same and it will be created at any given point in time, it should be a data type. On the contrary, however, what if there's some information you wanna store within your app that's never going to change? And so what's a good example of this? If I was to scroll on down and look at my genres here, this is the perfect use case. So with our genres, these don't really need to be a data type because we're not gonna constantly just create new genres and we're not going to allow our users to create genres. And so we don't need to build these on the fly. Essentially, what we could do is just create a list of genres once in our database and have that information always stored in the database. And what's the benefit to that? The benefit is that anytime you wanna reference a genre, because you've already created it in your database, you don't need to create it again. And another small benefit is that it just ensures some consistency with how this data is created. So if we were to create this list of genres once, and we spell out all of these genres exactly how you see them, it's just going to ensure that if we ever need to store and save a comedy genre, we can just reference this from our option sets list. And because it's already been stored in our database, it's going to pull from this existing value. So every time we wanna save the comedy genre, it's going to look exactly like this. And the reason why that's important is because if you're creating something as a data type, you might create multiple different versions of the same genre by accident. So one time you might spell comedy with a capital C, another time it might be a lowercase c, another time it might be a lowercase c, and when it comes to programming, if these don't look the exact same, you're gonna run into a problem. So that's why option sets are important. The main benefit though is you build them once and you can always reference them at any given point in time. And so what you'll see today is when it comes to my option sets list, all of this is information that we're gonna reuse time and time again. So it's gonna save us having to recreate them as data types every single time we wanna reference them. And in our tutorial today, our very first option set is known as the content type. So every single time a piece of content is created, remembering that a piece of content is either a movie or a TV show under the same umbrella, we just need to recognize if it is a movie or a TV show. And so that's why I've created only two options today, because when we go to actually create that piece of content, we can just reference what it is from this list of pre-created options. Then of course there was our genre. So every single time we upload a piece of content, we're gonna store some genres on that piece of content just so that way we can filter this and display relevant genres to users later on throughout our tutorial. In a similar use case, we have a rating option set. So this is just my ratings of the actual piece of content. So is it G, PG, M, MA, and so on. And then finally, we have an option set known as the profile type. So whenever a user registers an account, they're either gonna be one of these two profile types. They're gonna be a normal user or they're gonna be an admin. And today we're gonna to give our admins special privileges to upload content and manage files. 
Now, if my entire explanation of option sets is still confusing you, I do have another dedicated tutorial which does explain this in a little bit more detail, and it shows you some practical examples of when and why you should use option sets. If you also open up your bubble database, you'll see a tab here known as option sets, and this is where we're going to create those today. But the main reason why I wanted to open this now is because Bubble also has a dedicated tutorial that explains these in more detail. And look, it's not going to hurt my feelings if you do want to watch this tutorial. I completely get it. It took me a while before I started using option sets myself, but it's one of those things that once you use them, it's kind of hard to imagine life without them. But for now, what I'd like to do is add all of those option sets into my database. So I'm just going to quickly skip this tutorial here. And the first thing you might notice is that the interface for creating option sets looks much the same as the interface for creating a data type. So on the left here, we can add in our option set. And in a moment on the right, you'll see we can add in all of the options for our option set. And that's because option sets and data types are quite the same thing. You need to just remember that option sets are like data that we're just going to pre-install into our database. So we already are giving it a value and we know it's not going to change unlike a data type, which is dynamic and fluid. No two entries under a data type will probably be the same. And so what we're gonna do first of all is create the option set for the content type. So that was the first one on my list here. And so if we jump back into bubble, I'm gonna create the option set known as content type. And when I create this, you'll now see that we can add in all of the different options within this. And as I mentioned before, there's two options in this list. A piece of content can be a movie or it can be a TV show. And that is literally all we need to do. So now whenever we create a new piece of content under our data type, we can link that to this option set and determine what that piece of content is. I'll then just jump back into bubble. I can tick off that I've added this option set in and the next one is going to be my genre. So I'm going to jump back into bubble. I'll create a new option set known as the genre. And then I'm just going to add all of my genres I have within this list here. So we'll start by adding the comedy genre, there was action, drama, thriller, and then I think there was also one for family. Now, for the sake of our tutorial today, I've kept this list quite short. However, if you would like, you could pause this tutorial and add in a full list of any genre you want. But as I mentioned, I wanted to keep this pretty simplified today. I don't want you to sit here watching me add in 20 different genres. I'm just going to keep it as this short list. So what we're going to do is jump back into Bubble highlight all of these options and tick those off. Then below this, there was our ratings. So we're gonna jump into bubble. We'll create a new option set called a rating, and then we'll add all of the rating options in. So there was G, PG, M, MA, and R. These are all pretty self-explanatory. We'll jump back into Notion, highlight these, tick those off, and you can really start to see how easy it is to add option sets into your database. And as I mentioned, the beauty is that because we're pre-installing this data in our database, we never have to create this again. We can always just reference the information we've already put in our database. Then finally, there was the profile type option set. So I'm gonna create a new option here called profile type. And then of course, there was a user or an admin. I'll leave it as those two options. We'll then jump back into Notion, tick those items off, and now we can finally scroll back to our data types and add all of the data fields for each of these. And this is where you'll really start to see your database come to life. And in my opinion, when we walk through each of these data fields, everything's going to make a lot more sense. So let's start with our user data type here. Every single time a user creates an account, as I mentioned before, we're gonna to wanna to store some information about that person. So their name, their profile photo, and so on. So what we're gonna do is jump back into Bubble, head back to our data types, and open up our user data type. Then within the right-hand side of our page, we're gonna create a new data field. Now, this looks slightly different to the process of creating an option set. And the main reason for that is because when you add a field in, you also need to give it a type. And the type, as the name would suggest, just determines what type of information you're going to store. So if I was to call this data field the user's name, this field type should just be stored as text. But as you'll see within our list here, you have a long list of options. You could make this a number, a date, a yes, no value, a file, an image, or an address. So you have all of these different options, and that's why we have this drop-down menu. Now, for our name here, I'm just gonna store this as text. It's super straightforward and basic. Then for our user, there was also a profile photo. 
Now, something I should point out is the way in which I've spelt this data field. As you'll see, I've got two separate words here, but they're not separated with a space. They're intentionally separated with a dash. Now, the reason for that is because when it comes to my data fields, if I have two words, I like to separate them with a dash. So that way I can easily tell them apart from my data types. So my data types don't have dashes between two words, whereas my data fields do. Now, look, this isn't completely necessary, but this is just a small quality of life thing I like to do inside a bubble. It just helps me recognize what's a data field and what is a data type. Now for this field type, I'm gonna scroll on down and set this to be an image because of course a user is going to upload an image to their profile photo. I'll then choose to create this here. And now after adding this data field in, while we're here, there's also something else I should point out. As you might notice on the right hand side of the actual field, you have the ability to add a default value for each data field. And so what that just means is that whenever someone creates a user account, you can automatically apply what information you wanna store within a field. Now, while you wouldn't do something like that for the user's name, because of course we don't know what every user's name is going to be. We want them to add that in. But when it comes to things like the profile photo, on our user registration page, we're not actually going to prompt a user to upload a photo immediately, because that's going to add a lot of friction to the registration process. We are, however, later on going to add a user settings page within our app, which will prompt someone to upload a profile photo then. But what happens if a user doesn't actually upload a custom profile photo? What I'd like to do is upload a default image, which is going to look like an avatar. So that way, if they don't have a profile photo, at least we have an image to display for their account. Now, if I just open up a separate tab here, I've gone ahead and I've created a Google Drive of all of the images I'm gonna use within my tutorial today. And of course, I'll be sure to include a link to this within the description of this video. So that way you can download these assets and follow along with me. But what you'll notice is that we have a custom profile photo here, which is just going to look like a default avatar. It's super straightforward. So what I'd recommend doing is pausing this tutorial, downloading this entire folder, because what I'm gonna do now is upload that default profile photo as the default value here. And then of course, if the user takes the time to upload their own profile photo, it's going to replace this default value, which is the exact experience we wanna create. So what I'm gonna do is upload that profile photo now. And once that image has been uploaded, I can jump back to my Notion checklist, tick off that we finished adding the name and the profile photo. And I can see that there's two data fields left. The next one is going to be a bookmarks list. So if someone wants to save a piece of content, which of course is a movie or a TV show, to their saved list, this is where they're gonna be able to do this. So for the bookmarks, what we're gonna do is create a brand new data field and call this bookmarks. But when it comes to this field type, this is where you're really gonna to start to see the power of Bubble come to life. In Bubble, you have the ability to create what's known as a relational database. And once again, that is probably just a whole bunch of jargon that I've just said. But what this really means is that we can create a connection between two different data types. So under our user data type, if someone wants to save a list of pieces of content, I'm gonna link this to my content data type. So that way, anytime someone selects that they wanna save an item, it's going to add that item to a list under their account. And you'll see that come to life when we build that feature out. But for now, I just want to set this field type here to be linked to a separate data type, which you'll see within my drop down menu. So I'm going to link this to my content data type. And I'm going to tick this option here to make this a list with multiple entries because a user will be able to save multiple pieces of content, not just one. So I'm going to choose to create this here. And then finally, for the very last data field, this is going to be the profile type. And for this field type, I want the user to only be able to have one of two options. And of course, those options were created in my option set list. So under our option sets here, we can reference the profile type. I can create this. And what you'll now see is that I also have the ability to set a default value. So by default, I wanna make everyone just a standard user. And it's only when you create an account that I'm gonna show you later on how you can make yourself an admin because later on, we're also going to give admins special privileges. So they are the only people who should be able to visit pages like dashboards and also upload new content. And so by default, I want everyone to be a user. And now look, that is all of the data fields we need to add into our user data type. 
So we're going to tick those off and we can move along down to the next data type, which is our content. And this is probably one of the bigger data types today. But if we jump into our bubble editor, we can open up the content data type and the very first data field is going to be the title. So this is like the name of the piece of content. So that means that this field type will just need to be a basic text field. It's super straightforward. Then for the next field, I'm gonna call this the thumbnail image. So this is the image you're actually gonna see on the homepage of Netflix for each show. And this field type will of course be an image. It's pretty self-explanatory. And look for the thumbnail image. We're not going to add a default value because each thumbnail image is going to be different. So we're going to allow you as the admin to upload a custom image whenever you create a new entry. Then for the next field, I'm gonna call this the description. So this is going to be the brief description about each piece of content that we're going to display when someone wants to preview this. So for this field type, it's going to once again, just be a basic text field. Then for the next field, I'm gonna call this genres. So is this piece of content a comedy, an action, a thriller? And of course, we've already created the genres under an option set. So for this field type, I'm gonna link this to my genre option set. And I'm gonna tick that this should also be a list with multiple entries because one piece of content can have more than one genre. I'll create that there. Then for the next field, we're gonna store a rating for this piece of content. And similar to the previous field, this is going to be linked to our option set, which is a rating. Now I'm not gonna tick that this should be a list with multiple entries because one piece of content should only ever have one rating at a time. So I'll create this field and we don't need to leave a default value. I'm gonna allow you to select what rating it is whenever you upload that content. Then for the next field, this is going to be called the published year. Now, contrary to what you might think, this field type is just going to be a text field. You could, however, add a number if you really wanted, but the only reason I ever use numbers for a data field is if I ever wanna perform calculations or sort something by chronological order. And in this case today, I don't need to do either of those things for my published year. So I'm just gonna store this as text, which still will allow me to store a number. The field type of text just essentially means you can store any characters inside of it. So I'm gonna create this as a text field. Then for the next field, I'm gonna call this the content type. And I can see I just have a small typo there. And this field type is once again going to be linked to our option set known as the content type. So is it a movie or a TV show? And it can only be one of the two things, not both. So this will not be a list. It will only be one item. Then for the next couple of fields, we're gonna to start to actually link this particular data type to the file in which will allow us to stream this piece of content. So as I mentioned before, all of these data fields are relatively lightweight. Because when you think about it for things like the title, we only need to load a couple of words. For the thumbnail image, it's only one image. But of course, if we were storing the file directly under this data type, it would load that every single time we just want to display, let's say, even the thumbnail image for a piece of content. And we don't want that. And that's why we've separated the movie content, for instance, to a separate data type. So what I want to do today is recognize that if this piece of content is in fact a movie, what I would like to do is link this to the movie content data type which later on in a moment is going to store the actual file that we will start streaming. And so that way we can still easily display our content on our homepage, but if we ever need to be sent to a page to actually stream that content, we can just pull out the movie file that was linked to this data type. And so what I'm gonna do is create a new field here known as the movie file. And I'm going to link this field type to the movie content data type. And one movie should only have one file. So I'm gonna to choose to create this here. Now the next thing we'll need to factor in is what if this piece of content is a TV show? What I'm gonna do is then link that to a list of seasons because a TV show can have multiple seasons. And perhaps I should quickly just jump back into Notion here and explain how I've built out the difference between the seasons and the episodes. So when it comes to the seasons, I'm mainly just gonna use these as a way to sort all of my episodes. So for the actual files that are going to stream for each episode, these are under our episode data type. And so today what I'm gonna do is create a bunch of episodes and then store those within each season. And then I'm gonna store a bunch of seasons inside of each TV show. So that way I'm not storing the actual files that we're gonna stream under the main piece of content, but if I still wanna access those files, I can easily just fetch those from down my list. 
So it kind of looks like a chain in a way where everything is connected. So under our content data type for the time being, I'm going to create a new field here. And this field is going to be called TV seasons. And for this field type, I'm going to link this to, as you guessed, my season data type. And I will tick that this should be a list because a TV show can have multiple seasons. Now there's just one last data field we need to create and I'm going to call this the is published. So this is going to be like the published status for this piece of content. Because when you create something like a TV season or a movie, it might take you time to add all of the seasons and episodes or movie files into that piece of content. So right away, you might not want to publish it. Or you might want to create that entry in your database in advance, but you might not have the rights to actually stream something until a particular date. And so what we're going to do is set this is published field to be a yes, no type. So under our basic types, we're going to set this as yes, no. So it either is going to be published or it's not. And when it's not published later on, we're going to build out a feature that allows us to hide any pieces of content that are not published. Now, another thing we're going to do for this field is set the default value to equal no, because by default, a piece of content should not be published. It's only when you mark it as yes, it is published that we want it to be displayed. So that's why I'm updating the default value here. But look, that's everything that we needed to add under our content data type. So what I'm going to do is jump back to my notion checklist, highlight all of these data fields and tick those off. And we're starting to get to the end of the database here. The next data type we're going to build out is the season. And look, this one's fairly straightforward. As I mentioned, we're actually not going to store too much information inside of a season. The purpose of a season is to just create a way that we can sort and filter episodes. So when it comes to our season, we're going to open up this data type and the very first field I need to create is just going to be called the season number. So is it either season one, two, three, or up to something like 10? And now this field type is in fact going to be a number because later on, I'm going to want to sort all of my seasons in chronological order. And when they're a number, Bubble can easily do that. So I'm going to create this field here. And then finally, I'm going to create another field known as episodes. And this is where we're going to store all of our episodes, which is our separate data type. So for this field type, I'm going to scroll to my data types and link this to my episode data type. And because we're going to have multiple episodes in an individual season, I'm going to take this option to make this a list with multiple entries. I'll create that. We can then jump back into Notion, tick those fields off, and we can build out all of the data fields under each episode. So the very first thing I'd like to add is going to be the episode number. So under our episode data type, I'll create a field and I'll call this the episode number. Now, similar to the season number, the purpose of the episode is to just recognize is this episode one, two, three, four, and so on. And of course, I want to be able to sort all of those episodes once again in chronological order. So that's why today I'm going to store this data field as a number. I'll create that there. Then for each episode, I'm also going to store a title. So what you might notice on Netflix is that each episode tends to have a quirky little title that's related to the actual content inside of the episode. And look for this field type, it's just going to be text because this is just essentially the name of the episode. Now, each episode is also going to have its own thumbnail image because when we're displaying a long list of episodes within each season, I want each one of those to have a dedicated image so that way we can easily tell them apart. So for this field type, similar to before, it's just going to be an image and this will be a single image. So we don't need to check that box there. Each episode should also have its own description. So this will just be a small one to two sentences about what the episode entails. So this is just going to be a standard text type. I'll create that there. And then as I mentioned before, the episodes is where we're actually going to store the files that will be streamed. So I'm going to create a new field here and I'm going to call this the file and the field type here should be a file. I'll then choose to create that. And that is everything we need to build out within this data type. So we can check all of those fields off and we have one very last data field that we need to add under our movie content. So as I mentioned before, if a piece of content is a movie, I don't want to store that huge file under the main data type. Instead, I want to break that down into a separate data type so that way we don't need to load it whenever we need to load a piece of content. But of course, once we create a connection, which we've already done, we can choose to stream that file whenever we need. So if I jump back into Bubble, I'm going to open up our movie content 
And we're gonna create one field here known as the file. And similar to before, this is also going to be a file type. And just like that, that is everything we need to build within our own custom database. There is one last thing I should point out though, and that is that under our user data type, you may have noticed we have this text here, which displays the words privacy rules applied. Now, if we click on this, it's gonna open up our privacy tab. And essentially what this means is that by default, Bubble has applied a privacy rule to our app where users are only able to view the data in which they create themselves. Now that is not the experience we wanna to create today. What that essentially means is that if you as the admin were to log in and were to create a new piece of content, so a new movie or a TV show, your users wouldn't actually be able to view it. Only your account would be able to view that piece of content. And so when it comes to a streaming service, we actually want everyone to be able to view all of the content. So we don't need this privacy rule. So what we're gonna do is head over to this little trash can icon. We're going to click that and that will remove it. And now our user data type will be publicly visible. And thankfully after doing this, that is the very last thing we need to do when it comes to configuring our database. Something else I should quickly just point out is that when you're using a free bubble account, you are quite limited as to how much data you can store within your database. You definitely will be able to store and stream movie files, but you're not gonna be able to upload hundreds of shows. In order to do that, you will need to upgrade to a paid account. But of course, everything in our tutorial today is going to be built using a free Bubble account. And as I mentioned, you are gonna see throughout our tutorial today how I upload my own TV shows and start streaming those. But I just wanted to make note of this because as you start to scale your application, you will need to upgrade to a paid account. But look, that is absolutely everything I wanted to mention when it comes to creating our own custom database. Although there were quite a few little complexities and nuances that I had to try and explain throughout this process, it's kind of crazy that you can build all of this without having to write a single line of code. Once we've finished taking the time to set up and configure our own custom database, we can move along down to the full list of features I've set out within our checklist today. Now look, as you'll see, this checklist is quite extensive. There's so many features that I wanna cover, but at the very top of my list, I just wanna build out a user registration page. So this is going to be the page where a user lands, where they can sign up and register to our platform. Now, throughout our tutorial today, what I'm gonna do is actually break this page down into two separate modules. Within the first module, what we're gonna do is actually take the time to design this page. And then within the second module, we're gonna build out the workflows that enable us to process a subscription. Because of course, if someone's signing up to Netflix, we're gonna to want to charge them a monthly subscription. And today we'll be doing that through Stripe. But within our first module, as I mentioned, we're just gonna keep this pretty straightforward and we're gonna design the page itself as well as build out our very first visual workflow. So let's jump over into our bubble editor. Now at this point in time, this whole editor should be blank. Of course, we've already taken the time to set up our database, but there should be nothing on any of the pages. Now by default, Bubble's going to include an index page, which is the page you're currently viewing, inside of any app you create. So the index page is like the home page for your actual product. And so we don't wanna build out the user registration page on this page directly. We wanna create a separate page for that. So what we're gonna do is open up our page dropdown menu, and then we're going to create a new page, and we're just gonna call this the register page. I'll then choose to create that. Bubble's going to create this, and now it's going to send us through to this new page. Now, before we can actually add any elements onto this page and build out any of the core functionality, what we need to do is take care of a little bit of housekeeping. And this is going to be very useful if you are brand new to Bubble. And what I mean by that housekeeping is that if we were to double click on this page and open up our property editor, so this is going to be the menu where you can make changes to any of the visual settings within your app. What you'll see is that if we open up our layout tab here, when it comes to creating any page inside of Bubble, the very first thing you'll need to do is set a container layout on this page. And so what on earth is a container layout? When you're building your application, you're obviously going to add a bunch of different elements onto your page. So that can be things like text, images, videos, or even buttons. And so because all of these elements sit inside of your page, your page acts as like a container. So if you think of one of those Tupperware containers, instead of adding ingredients into it, we're going to add elements, which is everything you'll see on your left-hand menu. And so within our overall container, which is our page, we need to determine an order in which all of our elements will be shown. And so right now, by default, this is going to be set to fixed. And if you open up this drop-down menu, you're gonna see four different options. 
But look, thankfully, I'll only ever choose between two of these four options, and that is the option between a row or a column. I'll personally never use the fixed or the aligned to parent. But the main difference between the row and the column is just the order in which elements will be placed on your page. So if I was to select the row option, what this means is that any elements you add onto your page will be stacked horizontally. So that means sideways across your page. And so perhaps the best way to illustrate this is just by showing you a real example. So if I select on the row option here, and then if I just add two elements onto my page, so I'm just gonna add two buttons. As you'll see, these will now be positioned side by side. So they're gonna be scaled horizontally across our page. Whereas if I was to double click on my page once again, open up my layout tab, and now set the container layout to be a column. These two elements will now be stacked vertically, so down our page. And now look, when it comes to an overall page, when you think about most websites or modern applications, although you will have certain sections of a page that could be positioned horizontally across a user's browser, all of the actual core elements of a page are stacked vertically, so from top to bottom. And look, when I build out this page in a moment, you'll see exactly what I mean by that. But one thing I really just wanna highlight with this illustration is that when it comes to the overall container layout of a page, I will always choose the column option. However, later on today, I'm going to explain when we would in fact choose the row option, not for a page, but instead for a group, which is like a small page within your overall page. But look, we don't need to dive too much into that right now because I don't wanna overwhelm you with information. But right now, before we add any elements onto our page, we're gonna set the container layout here to be a column. I'm then going to quickly just delete these two buttons because I don't need those. I'm gonna double click on my page and then jump over to my appearance tab here. Now, the first thing I'd like to do on this page is give it a background. So right now the background is set as a flat color and that color is white. However, if I was to open up Netflix in a private browser here, it's gonna redirect me through to the registration page. And as you can see, they have a custom background that is an image. And so what I wanna do is update my background to be this exact image. But how can we access this same image that Netflix has used? Look, thankfully I've already gone ahead and I've done the hard work for you. So if I was to jump back to my main browser here, what I've done is I've taken the time to upload a couple of different image assets we're gonna use throughout our tutorial today into a Google Drive folder. And look, I'll be sure to include a link to this drive within the description of this video. So that way you can easily save these and then upload these directly into your Bubble app. But as you'll see within this drive, I've already taken the time to upload the exact image you need. But perhaps I could also just show you a cool way as to how I source this image. So if I was to jump back to the real world Netflix app, what I did was I right clicked on the page within Google Chrome. I inspected the element, which opens up this very confusing menu here which if you're not familiar with coding or HTML, this might seem a little bit overwhelming. And now look, I myself don't know how to write code, but one thing I do understand is what an image URL looks like. So I can see here, if I hover over this link, it shows me a preview of this background image. And so this is the exact image that I wanted to source. Then if I double click on this link, this shows me the exact link where this image is saved on the internet. So if I was to make a copy of that link, jump back over to my main browser and then paste this in. What you'll now see is that we have a preview of this image and I can right click on this and choose to save this as a standard image. So if you're wondering, that is how I source this image that we're gonna be using today. So I'm gonna to choose to close this here. I'm then gonna jump back into my bubble editor and for the background style here, I'm gonna update this from being a flat color and I'm gonna set this to be an image. I'm then gonna to choose to upload a static image and it's going to be that exact image that you've just saved. Then once my image is uploaded, I'm just gonna quickly scroll and down and update a few of the settings here. So I'm gonna take this option to make this image as wide as the parent element. So the parent element is the page itself. So I just want this image to stretch out and take up the full page. I'm also then just gonna tick both of these boxes below this, which are just going to repeat the image vertically and horizontally if the page expands out. And look, that's all we'll need to change here. The next thing we'll need to build out is the actual form that sits in the middle of the page that allows someone to register for our application. So once again, if I was to jump into the real world Netflix product, as you can see in the center of this page, we kind of have this block here, which contains a heading as well as two input fields and a button. So of course, this is where someone can add their email as well as a password. And so if I look at this page here, as I mentioned, I can see this block element that sits in the middle of it. And in order to replicate this in Bubble, thankfully it's a fairly straightforward process. 
Within Bubble, you have the ability to add what's known as a group element. So if I was to jump back to my main Bubble editor here and scroll on down to my containers menu, you'll see we have this option to add a group onto our page. And one thing you might have noticed is that once again, I just used that C word, and that is of course, containers. And of course, if you were paying attention, our overall page was a container. So if we were to add a group onto our page here, you can kind of think of this group as like a mini page that sits inside of our overall page. So right now we have a container within our overall container. And so because group elements act like a page within your overall page, you also have the ability to give them a container layer. So do you remember before when I mentioned that even though the container layout of our overall page was a column, we would still have the ability to position elements horizontally across our page? Using group elements, you can do exactly that. So if I was to give this group a container layout of a row, what I could do is then go and add two button elements directly into this group here. And if I was to eventually just update the width here, which I'll explain how to do in more detail in a moment, what you'll now see is that both of our buttons are now positioned horizontally across our page. So I just wanted to illustrate that that is how we can create a page in any layout that we want. And look, today throughout our tutorial, you're gonna see me using lots of different groups. The way I like to think of groups is that they're like Lego blocks. So you can easily stack them on top of each other and build out the exact experience you want for the design of your application. Now look, I'm just gonna quickly trace back a few steps. So at this point, you should have only just added this group to your page and done nothing else. Now, the very first thing I typically do with any group element is not update the container layout, but I like to just jump over to my appearance tab and just attach the default style of this group. And the reason for that is because I wanna give this a flat background color. So while I'm building up my application, I like to color code my groups in a way that I can easily interpret where they sit on my page. Because as you just saw before, if this group doesn't have a background color, and if I was to click away, you wouldn't actually be able to see that there's a group on my page. So you can easily get confused as to where all of your elements sit. So just a personal preference of mine is that when I'm building my application, I like to give my groups a flat background color. And look, typically I'll even make these a shade of red or a shade of green or even blue. The purpose of doing this is so that you can easily see how your page is built while you're building it. When you go to actually preview and publish your app, however, you can always just set the background style to be none. So that way it creates that clean look that your end users will see when you actually go to publish your app. But for the time being, what we're gonna do is just give this a flat background color. Now look for the color of this group today, I'm actually just gonna make this black because that is the actual color that this group was in the real world Netflix app. So what I'm gonna do is leave this as black. However, when it comes to the opacity here, I'm just gonna set this to be 80%. So that way it's kind of transparent and you can see that there's a background that sits behind it. Now look, that's all I'm gonna change within my appearance tab here. What I'm then gonna do is jump over to my layout tab. And the first thing I'll need to do here is update the container layout of this group. So inside of this group, do I want elements to be positioned vertically down? Or perhaps do I want them to be positioned horizontally across? So I'm obviously just gonna need to choose between a row or a column option. So if I jump over to the real world Netflix product, what I can see is that all of my elements are stacked on top of each other, which means they're positioned vertically down my page, which means we're gonna need to select the column option for the container layout of this group. So I'm gonna jump back into my bubble editor. I'm gonna set this as a column. And then what I'm also gonna do is update the width settings of this group. So right now, if you were to look within your layout tab, you can see that the width is set at a fixed value of 280 pixels. Now, if you're brand new to bubble, what I just said is probably gonna go right over the top of your head. And look, that is completely fine. In simple terms though, what this means is that at any point in time throughout your application, the width of this group will be 280 pixels, which is this exact size you see here. So that's what it means by a fixed width. It essentially just means that it's always going to be fixed at whatever value you've added here. And now look, that's actually not the experience we wanna to create today. Instead, what I'd like is obviously for this group to be larger. So as you'll see, 280 pixels isn't actually much width on my page. And another thing I should point out is that when an element is a fixed width, it does not create a responsive experience. So if I was to quickly just jump over to my responsive tab here and shrink the size of my page down, what you'll see is that when our page gets to this element, it's actually just going to cut that element off. So on things like a mobile device, if an element is a fixed width, 
it's not going to be fully responsive. So it's not going to cater to a user's device size. So instead, what we're actually gonna do is unselect that this should be a fixed width. And now what I'm about to tell you is something that's going to absolutely change the way you build applications in Bubble. And that is the exact settings you need to create a fully responsive app across any device size. So right now, as you'll see, we now have an option to add a minimum and a maximum width. So our width is no longer fixed at one value. And look, by default, the maximum width is going to be infinite. So that means that regardless of how wide we expand our page, this group is going to continually take up as much width as it can. And so if our maximum width is infinite, what I could also do is set our minimum width here to be zero. And what that then means is that regardless of how small our page is, this group will continually expand down right to zero pixels. So that of course means that regardless of whatever device size someone is viewing our Netflix clone on, whether it be a mobile, a tablet, or a desktop, this group is now going to be fully responsive. And look, these settings are going to be used time and time again throughout our tutorial today. And if you really wanna take one thing away from this tutorial, it's that if you wanna build a fully responsive app, set your minimum width to zero and your maximum width to infinite. Now, the only problem that I have with setting the maximum width to infinite on this group here is that it obviously just takes up the entire width of my page. Whereas, as you could see in the real world Netflix product here, it only takes up a small fragment of the total page itself. So what I might actually wanna do here is set a maximum width, just so it caps out how much width this group can actually take on my overall page. So what I'm gonna do is set the maximum width here as 400 pixels. Now look, there's no scientific reason why I selected 400. I just think that that's going to be enough to add and display all of my elements inside of this group. But as you also might notice, our group is positioned to the left-hand side of my page. So what I'm gonna do is update its horizontal alignment on my page itself, and I'm gonna position that at the center of my page. And then we're also gonna to need to create some sort of way to push this group further down, because right now it is positioned directly at the top of my page. And so in order to push this group down my page, what I'm gonna do is add in 150 pixels of margin at the top. And as you can see, that's pushed it right into the position we need. So regardless of my page's width, this group is always going to be in the center, and it's always going to be positioned further down in our page. Now look, I am gonna come back and update the height and the margin settings in a moment, but the thing about changing a height in a group in Bubble is that if I was to set the minimum height now to be zero, because by default we have this option selected to fit the height of this element to the content inside of it, it means that this group is going to collapse around all of the elements we add directly into it, which at this point in time, we haven't added any elements into that group. So what we need to do is just build out everything inside of this group, and then we can come back and update this setting in a moment. But look, for the time being, we're gonna jump back to our UI builder here, and what we're gonna do is add in a text heading inside of this group. So under my visual elements, I'm gonna grab a text element, and look, for the sake of our tutorial today, I'm just gonna have this display the words register and account. Then when it comes to the styling of this element, I'm just going to detach the default style. I'll update the font size here to be 20, I'll also update the font color to be white, so that way we can actually see it within our black group. I will also align all of the text inside of this element to the center. And then finally, I'll choose to bold this text. Now, the other thing I'll need to do is make this text fully responsive. So if I jump over to my layout tab, similar to the group, what we're gonna do is unselect that this should be a fixed width. We will set the minimum width to be zero and leave the maximum width as infinite. So that means that this text element can take up as little or as much space as it needs on my page. So if I was to open up my responsive tab and reduce the width of my page down, as you'll see, as the page itself collapses, this text will just break onto new lines. So it's gonna create that truly responsive experience that we need. What I should also point out is that at this point in time, we have all of this empty space at the bottom of this element. So if we jump to our layout tab once again, I'm just gonna update the minimum height to be zero. And because we have the default setting set to fit the height of this element to the content inside of it, it's going to collapse perfectly around all of that text. And now look, the very last thing we'll need to do while we're in our layout tab is just give this 20 pixels of margin at the top, 20 on the left and 20 on the right. So that way it ensures that it won't touch the borders of my black group. Now below this, what we're gonna do is add in two input fields. And within those input fields, we're obviously going to allow someone to add their email and their password. 
So if we scroll on down to our input forms, we're gonna grab a standard input form and add this into my black group. And when it comes to any input field, the very first thing I like to do before I update any of the styling or any of the layout settings is just give this a name. So if I select in the name field here at the top of my property editor, you're gonna have the ability to update the name here. So I'm gonna call this input register email because this is where someone's going to add the email that they would like to register. Now, the reason why it's so important to update the naming conventions of your input fields is because when you go to build out a workflow in a moment, if you ever need to pull information that a user has added into an input field, it's gonna save you so much time if you know the exact input field where they store that information. So that's why I'm just gonna take the time to update this. Now, before we update any of the text that's displayed within this input field, I'm just gonna scroll on down to my styling and once again, detach the default style. And the reason for this is because right now I can't actually see where this input field sits on my page because all of its borders are black. So I'm just gonna quickly update the color of this input field to be white. And look, this white color is just the text itself that someone's going to type into this input field. I'm also going to update the placeholder color to be white. And now you'll start to see the text that's already placed inside of this field will now be white. I'll update the background style to be a flat color. And I'm just gonna make this a shade of gray that I have here. So if you'd like this color code, it's 696464. And then from here, I'm also just gonna update the border color here. So for the border, I'm gonna set this to be white as well. And now we can clearly see where this input field sits inside of our black group. So what I'm gonna do is scroll on up and I'm also gonna update the placeholder text that sits within this input field. So placeholder text, as the name would suggest, is just some text that's placed inside of the input field until a user actually types in this. So if I was to quickly just preview my app here, what you'll see is that my placeholder text displays the words type here. Then once I click in this and type in something, it's going to make that text disappear. So I'm just gonna update this placeholder text to display the word email to prompt someone that this of course is where they can add in their email address. Now for this text, I might also just like to quickly bold this just so that way it stands out a bit more. And finally, within our appearance tab, the very last thing I'll need to do is update the content format for this input field. So the content format will actually just determine the type of data you store within this input field. So by default, it's stored as plain text. Whereas what you can see here is we have an option that's dedicated to storing an email. And what this just means is that Bubble's gonna make sure whatever value someone adds into this field it should equate to a valid email address. So it's gonna to have to finish in a domain, whether that be at gmail.com, at hotmail.com, or at their own custom domain.com. And so that is everything we'll need to change within our appearance tab. What we're then gonna do is jump over to our layout tab and make this input field fully responsive. So as you probably guessed, we're going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. We're going to set the minimum width to be zero and leave the maximum width as infinite. So that way this input field can take up as little or as much space as it needs on my page. Now, when it comes to the height of this input field, I'm actually gonna leave this as the default option, which is fixed at 48 pixels. So what this just means that at any given time, this input field will be this exact height that you see here. So this is 48 pixels. And so because someone's only ever gonna add their email address into this input, I don't need this to expand down to store more content. So I'm quite happy with leaving this as the default size. The last thing I will do though, is just add in 30 pixels of margin at the top, 20 on the left and 20 on the right. And that's just going to ensure that this input field won't touch any of the borders of my group or the element that sits above it. Now below this input field, I'd like to add in yet another. And look to streamline that, I'm just going to make a copy of this. I'm going to then select in my black group and paste in another version of that input. And for this input field, we're going to allow someone to store a password for their account. But of course, the very first thing I'll need to do is actually update the name of this input field, because right now it's called input register email copy. Whereas what I'd like this to be called is just input register password. I'll then jump over to my appearance tab. I'll update the placeholder text to display the word password. So that way a user knows that this is where they should add in their password. Then for the content format, I'm also gonna update this to store the value of a password. And what that's gonna do is just hide any of the characters that someone adds into this, so they won't be able to view them. 
And finally, I might also just like to close off some of this margin between both of these input fields. So I'm gonna select on my second input field, jump to my layout tab, and just update the top margin here to be 20, not 30. And that is the very last input field I'll need to add in. So what I'm gonna do from here is add a button element below this, which when that button is clicked, it's going to run a workflow and sign a user up to our app. So if I scroll on up to my visual elements, we're gonna grab a button here, We'll add this into my black group. And when it comes to the text inside of this button, I'm just gonna have this display the words, get started. And what we're also gonna do is update the styling of this button here. Now I'm not gonna actually detach the default style. Instead, what I'm gonna do is edit the primary button style here. And this then begs the question, Lachlan, what on earth is a style? Within Bubble, if you're to add any element onto your page, you can obviously customize the way it looks. So if I wanted to make this button, let's say red with white text, I could easily update the background color to be, let's say a light shade of red. But the problem with doing it this way is that if I was to add another button on a separate page in my app and I wanted it to be the exact same shade of red, every single time I customize that, I'd need to manually find the exact same color code and make this change. And so this is the benefit to creating a custom style. In Bubble, a style gives you the ability to create a design setting once, and then it allows you to easily reference those exact same settings at any point throughout your app on any given page. So instead of having to redesign my red button on every page, I could just take the time to create a custom style once, and then I could easily just reference the settings within that custom style whenever I wanna add a button onto a different page. And now look, a style isn't something like I use on every single element. If for instance, on my input fields, I'm only gonna use these gray input fields on one page, I don't really see the value in creating a custom style because I'm not gonna use them on separate pages. Whereas today within my tutorial, I can tell you right now that throughout our app, we're gonna be using a red button more than once. And so that's why I'd like to create this as a custom style. So I'm just gonna revert this change I've made here. And instead of detaching the default style, I'm gonna to choose to edit the style of my primary button here. So I'm gonna to choose to edit the style and it's gonna take us through to our styling tab where within this, you'll be able to make any changes here similar to what you would in your property editor. However, any changes made here are going to be the changes that are reflected to this button or I should say this style of this button whenever you reference it throughout your app. And so the only thing I wanna do with this button is just update the primary color here to be a shade of red. And if you'd like this color code, it's E50914. I'm also just gonna quickly jump over to my conditional tab here, and I'm just gonna remove this condition. So what this condition essentially just said was that when the button is hovered, so when someone puts their mouse over it, it's gonna change it to this color of blue, which I don't want. So I'm just gonna to choose to remove this for now. And just like that, if I was to jump back into my design tab, as you can see, because this button is referencing my primary button style, it is now going to be red by default. I'm then gonna to choose to jump to my layout tab and make this button fully responsive. So I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. As you probably guessed, we're gonna set the minimum width to be zero, leave the maximum width as infinite. So now this button can take up as little or as much space as it needs in my group. Now for the height of this button, I'm also quite happy with the default settings. So right now it has a height of 45 pixels. And look, if you really wanted it to match the same height as your input fields, you could set this to be something like 48 pixels because if you select on your input field, that is of course the same height. And the very last thing I wanna do for this button is just give it a top margin of 30 pixels, a bottom margin of 30 pixels, a left margin of 20, and then also a right margin of 20. And just like that, that is exactly how we can design this little sign up form on our user registration page. What I do just want to explain now is how we can actually build out the workflow to sign a user up to our app and of course store their account information within our database. And look, thankfully that couldn't be any simpler. What we're going to do is we're going to select on our button here, head to our appearance tab, and we're going to choose to add a new workflow whenever this button is clicked. And within this workflow, we're only going to do two things. If we first of all select from the account events here, we're going to choose to sign the user up. And what you'll now see is that we need to match both an email and a password with the relevant input fields on my page. And so this is where you'll really start to see those naming conventions come into play. If I wanna register the input where we're storing someone's email, I can easily just see here the input register email, and I'm gonna store its value. Then I'll do the exact same thing for our password. So for the password I wanna store, 
This is going to be the value of the input register password. And just like that, we would have created a brand new account within our own Netflix clone. It truly is that simple. Bubble takes care of all of the heavy lifting for us. The only other thing I'd like to do within this workflow is just create a navigation event. So right now, if a user comes to our registration page, that add in their email, their password, and they click this button. As you've just seen, within the workflow we just built, we would then create them an account, but nothing would happen. So the user wouldn't actually know if they've created an account or not. So what I wanna do is just recognize that after a user has created an account, I'd like to send them through to our home page, which if you remember, is the index page that's created by default. So right now this page is currently blank, there's nothing on it, but this is where we're gonna build out the home page of our Netflix clone. And so if I just jump back to my registration page and open up my workflow tab, I'm going to add an additional step within our workflow. And after we've signed a user up, we're gonna to head to the navigation events, we'll choose the go to page action, and we'll now set the destination page that someone will be redirected through to, to be our index page. It truly is as simple as that. Now that is everything we need to build within this workflow. The last thing we'll need to do is within our design tab, and that is that I just wanna take care of a little bit more housekeeping before we run a preview of this page. So if I just double click on my black group here and open up my layout tab, you may remember that previously I'd mentioned that we'd come back and update the minimum height setting of this group once we've finished adding all of our elements inside of it. So right now, this is exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna set the minimum height to be zero. And because we have this default setting here checked to fit the height of this element to the content within it, it's just going to ensure that this group will always collapse around these elements that we've created. And look, the only other thing I'm gonna do is quickly just jump back to my appearance tab. And if I scroll on down to my borders here, I'm just gonna set the roundness of the borders to be five. So that way when I click away, as you'll see our group here has some slightly curved edges. And then lastly, I'm just gonna select on my group again, jump back to my layout tab, and I'm just gonna add in 20 pixels of margin on both the left and the right hand side of this group. And the reason for that is because if I was to jump over to my responsive tab and view this page on a mobile device, if I didn't have this width on each side of this group, the group would just touch the borders of my page. Whereas right now when this shrinks down, it's just going to ensure that it never touches the side of the page itself. But look, after building all of that out, what we can do is run a preview of this experience and we can see what this is gonna look like as an end user. So I'm gonna come to this page here. I'm gonna add in my email address. So I'm just gonna say this is test at gmail.com. I'll add in a super secure password. I'll click this button. It's gonna run that workflow. It'll of course create a new account within our database. And then it's gonna send me through to our index page, which of course at this point in time is currently blank. So there should be nothing on it. But if I was to then jump back into bubble, open up my data tab, select my app data and choose to view all of my users in my app I can now see that we have a new user account. And that is of course the user with the email test at gmail.com. Now look, after building everything out, we're gonna jump back to my Notion checklist and we can check off that we finished building out the first section of our user registration page. Now look, in my opinion, one of the hardest things of this module was having to comprehend all of the different design concepts. But as you can see, when it came to actually building out the visual workflow, it was a super streamlined process. Moving our way down the checklist of items we have set out for us today, the next thing I just wanna focus on is being able to process a subscription payment. So this is going to be like an extension of our very first module where we learn how to register a user account. And of course, being able to process monthly subscription payments is essential for any Netflix clone, as well as any kind of streaming platform where you're putting content behind a paywall. And so that's exactly what we're gonna do today. So if we were to jump over into our bubble editor, we're gonna open up our user registration page that we had just created. Now at this point in time on this page, we built out this registration form and we created a workflow whenever someone added their email and password and clicked this button. And if you remember inside of this workflow, we first of all signed a user up and then we sent them through to our index page. Now we are gonna be changing this up in a moment. And the reason for that is because I wanna change the whole user experience of signing up an account because inside of that experience, we also need someone to add in their credit card details so that way we can start processing a subscription payment. 
And so the way we're going to do this is by breaking it into two different steps. On the very first step in our registration page, a user will still be required to add in their email and password. But when they click this button here, I'm not going to register an account immediately. Instead, what I'm going to do is hide this first group and I'm going to display a second group. And on that second group, that's where someone will be able to add in their payment details for a subscription. Then once they select that they're happy to confirm that subscription, I'm going to create a new subscription within Stripe and inside of my Bubble app. And then I'm going to continue to sign the user up and then redirect them through to our index page, just like we'd done in the previous workflow that we'd built. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually select on my group here. So right now this is called group A. And what I'm going to do is update the name of this group. I'm going to call this group register one, because within my whole registration process, this is going to be the first group that someone interacts with. I'm then going to click on this group and make a copy of it. And if I scroll on down with my new group, once again, the first thing I'm going to do is update the name of this. And in this case, I'm going to call this group register two, because this will be the second group of our registration process. Now within our second group, we actually don't really need to include much. In fact, perhaps the best way to illustrate what this group is going to look like is by showing you an example I've already prepared earlier. So if I jump over into a separate bubble editor, as you'll see, I've recreated the user registration page. And if I was to just hide this first group, I'm going to display my second group. And as you'll see, this group is pretty basic. It just has a text heading, it confirms the price of our subscription, and then it just has a subscribe button. And so the way our subscription feature is going to work is that when someone clicks this subscribe button, it's gonna redirect them through to a Stripe checkout page where they can add in all of their credit card details. Then once Stripe has verified and created that subscription, it's gonna send them back to our user registration page where it will then sign the user up and then redirect them through to our home page or our index page. And so as you can see, this group here is pretty basic. So we're just going to jump back to our main bubble editor. And the first thing we'll do is just delete these two input fields. We no longer need those. I'm going to make a copy of our text element here. I'm just going to jump to my layout tab and make this the previous element there. So I'm going to move this up within my group. And when it comes to the text inside of this element, I'm going to jump to my appearance tab. And this is just going to display the words subscribe for $14.99 per month. Now, by all means, you can make this price whatever you would like, but this is just what I'm using for my Netflix clone today. Now, while I'm also working with this text element, I'm just going to update the font size to be 14. So I'm going to make it slightly smaller. And I'm also just going to reduce some of the top margin here because there's quite a gap between both of these text elements. So if I just jump over to my layout tab, I'll scroll on down to my top margin and make that 10 pixels instead of 20. And then finally, the last thing I'd like to do is just select on my button here. I'll open up my appearance tab and I'll update the text displayed inside of this button to be the word subscribe. And that is everything we'll need to change within this second group. And so before we build out the process to actually subscribe a user to a subscription payment, we're actually going to need to create a workflow to hide our first group and then display our second group. And before we even do that, we're going to need to create a way to actually hide this second group by default. So right now, if you were to load this page, both of these groups would be visible. Whereas as I mentioned before, I only want my first group to be visible until someone clicks this button, in which case I want to hide my first group and show my second group. And so the way we can achieve that is by selecting on our second group. So our group register two. And if we jump over to our layout tab, we can uncheck this option here to make this element visible on page load, which means it's no longer going to be displayed. I'm also going to choose to collapse this element when it's hidden. So that means when this group is not being shown, it's not going to take up any space on my page. And I'm also going to select this option to animate the way that this group collapses. I'm going to make this fade in and out. So that's just going to create a smooth transition whenever it's shown or hidden. And look, I'm going to create the exact same transition on our first group here. So I'm going to select on my first group, our group register one. And within our layout tab, I am still going to keep this option selected because by default, I do want to display my first group whenever the page is loaded. However, when this group is no longer being shown, I don't want it to take up any empty space on my page. And so I'm going to choose to select this option once again to collapse this element when it's hidden. And then I'll also animate the collapse operation 
and make this fade in and out. Now what we'll need to do is actually build out the workflows that are going to hide and display the relevant group. So if I select my button here, which is get started, I'll jump to my appearance tab and open up our existing workflow. Now, as I mentioned, we are still going to use this workflow today, but it's not going to run when our get started button is clicked. So what I'm going to do is actually delete both of these workflow steps. And now within this workflow, the only thing I want to do is hide our first group and display our second group. So if I select to add an action and scroll on down to my element actions here, the first thing I'd like to do is hide an element. And that element will of course be our group register one. Then if we add an additional step to our workflow, we can once again head to our element actions and we can now choose to show an element. And that element will be our group register two. Now, one thing I should also point out is that although this group will be hidden, if someone has added their email and password into these input fields, it will still be stored inside of those fields. So we can still reference the value that someone adds. And look, we will be doing that when someone selects the subscribe button. And perhaps at this point, I should just show you a quick preview of what this is going to look like. So if someone comes to our user registration page here, let's say they add in an email and a password, they're going to click this button to get started. It's then going to hide our first group and then display our second group. And then of course, at this point in time, if someone agrees to our subscription price, they will click this button and then in a moment, we're gonna redirect them through to a page where they can subscribe with their credit card. And so in order to build that experience out, today we're gonna to be using an integration with Stripe, which makes the whole process incredibly straightforward. And so in order to integrate with Stripe, we need to open up our plugins library here. And if you type in the word Stripe, we're going to install the default Stripe plugin, which is a free plugin built by Bubble. And they're gonna to choose to close my plugin library. And the first thing you might notice is that within your plugin settings here, you have all of these input fields, which just tell you that you need to source your own Stripe API keys. Now, if you're brand new to using Bubble and you're not familiar with development in any way, an API key is essentially just a way to create a connection between both your Bubble application and your Stripe account. So it just sends information between the two. So for instance, if you were to process a payment within your Bubble account, it would send the user's credit card details through to Stripe. Stripe would verify those details. It would process the payment for you. And then it would send some information back to your Bubble app, just letting you know that that payment has been successful. And look, thankfully, it is a pretty straightforward process to source all of your API keys. And I'm actually gonna help you do this today. So over in a separate tab here, I have a blank Stripe account. So what you'll need to do is create your own Stripe account. And once you've created your account, you'll just need to verify some details about yourself. Normally you'll need an email and a phone number. And I'd really recommend taking the time to do that because if you don't verify your account, you might have some restrictions on some of the features that you can use inside of Stripe. But once you do that, we're gonna open up this developers tab here and then select on this API keys menu. And when you open this menu, what you'll see within your own account is a publishable key. You won't see all of these secret keys that I've created. I'll tell you what those are in a moment. But one thing you definitely will see is this publishable key here. And so what we're gonna do is make a copy of this. And as you can see inside of this publishable key, it just references that this is the API key for your live product. So if we were to open up Bubble, as you'll see here, there's a field which requires you to add in a live publishable key. So we're gonna paste this into here. And now the difference between the live version and the development version is that when you're actually building your app and running a test within your preview, Stripe's gonna reference these development API keys, which just means that it's going to allow you to process dummy transactions. Because of course, you're in the stage of actually developing your app. But once you publish your app, it's gonna use a separate set of API keys. And whenever you try to process a transaction in the live version, it will actually charge a real credit card and process that as a legitimate transaction. And so that is the difference between the two. And so it's super important that you source both of your API keys. So that way, when you actually go to publish your app, you don't have to reconfigure your Stripe integration. But look, that's how we sourced our live publishable key. What you can also see for our live version is that we need a secret key and a thing called a client ID. So the publishable key essentially just tells Bubble where it should point to in terms of which Stripe account you should actually process a transaction in. 
And then your secret key is kind of like a password. So once you get to this address, you say, hey, I want to process this transaction. Stripe's going to ask your bubble application, okay, I'm happy to do that, but can you provide the password to verify you are who you say you are? And that is the purpose of our secret key. So if we jump over into our Stripe account, you'll see an option here to create a secret key. And I'm going to create a brand new key here. And when you go to create a new secret key, you'll just need to verify your ID once again. Then once you've verified your ID, you will need to give this a name. I'm going to call this Netflix clone test. I'll choose to create this here. As you'll see now, Stripe will then provide you with your secret key. So you'll need to hover over this, copy it to your clipboard. I can then close this pop-up, jump over into my bubble editor and paste this within my live secret key field. And so that is how we can source both of our API keys here. Of course, there's the live client ID. We're going to source that in a moment. But before we do that, I just want to explain how we can source the development version of our publishable key as well as our secret key. So if we jump back into Stripe, over in the top right hand corner, you're going to see this little toggle here, which is called test mode. So if I toggle this on, it's going to refresh the page. And as you'll now see, it notifies us that we're viewing all of our API key details in what's known as test mode, which is just another way of saying you're viewing your development mode. And so now that we're in development mode, I'm going to copy across my publishable key, which as you'll see here, instead of this being my live publishable key, this is my test publishable key. So I'm going to copy that. I'll jump over into bubble and paste this within my publishable key development field. Then we'll need to do the exact same thing for our secret key. So by default, you should have a test mode secret key. You will just need to reveal this and then copy it. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to select on this button. I will hover over this, make a copy of it, jump over into my bubble editor, and then paste this within my secret key development field. Then from here, there's two very last bits of information I need to source. And that is both my development client ID and the live client ID. And thankfully that is super straightforward to source. So if we jump back into Stripe in order to grab those client IDs, we're just going to jump over to our settings page here. And if you head over to your connect menu option, you can open up the settings once again. And if you scroll right down to the bottom of the page, you're going to see your own client ID here. So I can see my test mode client ID. So I'm going to highlight that. I'll make a copy, jump over into Bubble and paste this into my client ID development field. And then of course, in order to grab the live version of my client ID, I just need to untoggle that we're viewing test mode. It's going to refresh my page. So now I'm viewing this in live mode. I'll then scroll on down to the bottom and I'll grab my live mode client ID. I'll highlight that, make a copy, jump back over to Bubble and paste that in. And that is how we can source all of our API keys here. It's a fairly straightforward process. The only other thing I'd like to do while we're in our plugin settings is just update the Stripe checkout version. So right now by default, it's using the V2 version, which as you can see is the legacy option. In our case today, I wanna to use the checkout V3 option, which is just the most recent option there. Now this is all perfect. So at this point in time, we should be able to process a transaction in Stripe. And now, as I mentioned, the way that's going to work is that when someone clicks this subscribe button, it's going to send someone through to a Stripe checkout page that's going to contain all of the details of a subscription product. Then once someone adds in their credit card details and selects to make that payment, Stripe's going to process that on our behalf. And it's then going to send someone back to our bubble app from which we're then going to continue running the workflow to actually sign that user up. And so what I'm going to do is select on our subscribe button here. And I'm going to choose to add a workflow. Now within this workflow, the very first thing I'd like to do is of course, charge a subscription product. So if I open up my actions menu, I'm going to go to my payment tab and I'm going to choose the option here to subscribe a user to a plan. And what you'll now see is that we need to choose a plan in which we want to subscribe someone to. Now in my Stripe account, I've already created a couple of different subscription plans, but what we'll need to do if you've just created a brand new Stripe account is create a brand new subscription plan as well. So if we just divert back into Stripe, and if you're to open up your products menu here, you'll see within my Stripe account, I've created a new product called the Netflix monthly subscription. So I've already taken the time to create a new product, but I do just want to walk you through the process of doing this because it is fairly straightforward. So what we're going to do is create a brand new product from scratch. 
You can call this whatever you want. I'm gonna call this the Netflix clone monthly subscription. And look, if you really wanted, you could add a description to this as well as a custom image. And look, I'm not too concerned about updating these, but if you did wanna add some information here, feel free to pause this tutorial and do that. Instead, what I'm more interested in doing is just scrolling down to the pricing details. So what I wanna do is set the price here to be $14.99. I'm gonna set this in US dollars, and I'm gonna make this a recurring payment, which is going to be billed monthly. If you really wanted, you could change the subscription cycle here, but look, I'm quite happy to leave it as a monthly payment. Then from here, I'm gonna to choose to save my product. And one thing I'd just like to point out after this product has been created is that if we scroll on down, you're gonna see an ID here for this product. So this is called the price underscore one and Z TG and a long list of characters. So if I was to now jump back into my bubble editor and if I refresh the page here, and if we were to open up the workflow that we were just working on under our Stripe plan, we should now see the new product that we just created. And so right now I'm looking for the price underscore one and Z, and I can't see it here. And there is a valid reason why it is not being displayed within this dropdown menu. And that is because if I jump over to my Stripe account, and if I look up to the top right hand corner here, I'm currently viewing this in live mode. Whereas in my bubble editor, I'm actually in development mode. So this is only displaying products that have been created within my development mode, not my live mode. So what I need to do in Stripe is toggle this test mode field. Then I'm going to just refresh my products page. And as you'll now see, I have a whole separate list of products that are created within the test mode. So these are all of the products that will be displayed in your development mode. And so what I need to do is add a new product here. I'm gonna once again call this the Netflix clone monthly subscription. And perhaps I could even just put this in brackets that this is in test mode. I'm going to scroll on down. I'll update my price to be $14.99. I'll set that as US dollars. And similar to before, it's just going to be a recurring monthly payment. I can then choose to save this product here. And if I now scroll on down, I can see that the ID here is price underscore one and Z T J U. And look, the long list of characters just goes on. But if I jump back into bubble, I'm gonna refresh this page once again. And if I open up the workflow, what I'll now see is a third product within this dropdown menu. And that is going to be our new Netflix clone subscription. So I'm gonna select on this here. And now the reason why I just wanted to take the time to explain the difference between creating a product in live mode and test mode is that of course, because when you go to publish your application, what you're gonna to need to do is create another product yet again in your live mode. So you just need to recognize that whatever changes you make in your test mode, when you publish your app, you'll also need to make those exact same changes in your live mode. Now look, at this point in time, this workflow step would redirect someone through to a Stripe page where they would add in all of their payment details. When that transaction has been successfully made, it's then going to redirect someone back to your Bubble app and it's gonna continue any additional workflow steps you add inside of this workflow here. And so this is where I want to re-add the steps where we actually sign a user up. So if I was to add an additional step here, I'm gonna to head to our account tab and choose to sign the user up just like we did before. And what I'll need to do is just match the email field. So I'm gonna reference the input register email, its value, then for the password, this will be the input register password, its value, and then finally, what I'd like to do is add an additional workflow step. I'll choose from a navigation event, select the go to page action, and I'll be sending someone through to our home page, which is also known as the index page. Now, something I should also point out is that if someone is sent through to our Stripe subscription portal, and that payment does not go through, these additional steps in our workflow will not run. It will stop at our first step. So that will then just ensure that only users with a subscription are going to be able to sign up a new account. Now look, this is everything I need to add within this workflow. And because both of these workflows are related to the same feature, which is registering a user account, what I'd like to actually do is color code these workflows. So that way, if I was to ever add any additional workflows to this page, I know that these two workflows are separated and that they belong together. So I'm gonna select on the workflow trigger 
And in bubble, you have the ability to update the event color here. So I'm just gonna set this to be something like green. And look, you can set this to whatever color you want, but look, I'm gonna do the exact same thing to my first workflow. So for the event color here, this will also be green. And that is everything we'll need to build out to finish off our user registration process. So what I'd like to do is run another preview of this and show you how this is all going to function. And so in our first step here, I'm just gonna add in yet another email. I'm gonna say this is test2 at Gmail. I'll add in another very secure password. I will select to get started. It's gonna hide my first group, show my second group. When I click on this, it's gonna send me through to a Stripe checkout page, which as you'll see, I'm now going to be subscribed to the Netflix clone monthly subscription, which is $14.99 a month. And if I wanna process a fake transaction here, thankfully Stripe actually has a series of dummy credit cards you can use. So if you were to just open up Google and type in Stripe dummy credit card, what you'll see is a website here where you can test a bunch of different payment methods. And so if you scroll on down, you're gonna see a long list here of different credit cards you can use. And so I'm just gonna use this Visa card here, which is the numbers four, two consecutively. So if I jump back to my application, I'll paste this in. For the expiry month, this can be any date in the future. So I'm just gonna say 0130. And then for the CVC number, this can be any three numbers. For my name, I'll just say that this is a test user. Then I'm gonna choose to subscribe to this. It's gonna process that payment. It'll create that within Stripe. And once that's been validated, it's gonna redirect me through to my own bubble application, which is then going to continue running the workflow to sign my account up. And then of course, it's gonna redirect me through to my index page here. And look, if you wanted to see how many users have subscribed to your product within your Stripe account, there's a couple of different ways you can do this. So if I was to open up my Stripe account here, you could first of all, open up your payments tab and it's gonna show you a long list of all of the different payments that have occurred within your account. If you also jumped over to the billing tab here, you can open up your subscriptions and you'll see a long list of all of the subscriptions that have been processed. So I can see a couple here. And look, there are multiple ways that you can source this information. Now, another thing I should point out is that within this module today, I explained how we could create a new subscription payment. But of course, everything within your app isn't so linear. I'm sure at some point you're gonna have users want to cancel their subscriptions, as well as of course, potentially update their subscription if you have multiple tiers. And look, if I was going to explain how to cover all of those use cases, I would actually be here for more than an hour. And so if you wanted to learn how to cater for all of those things, thankfully I do have an existing tutorial that will cover everything you need to know. So within the Notion checklist here, right at the bottom of this module, what I've done is I've included a link to an existing YouTube video that I have that explains everything you need to know about Stripe subscriptions. And so within that video, I leave no stone unturned and it's gonna walk through absolutely everything you need to know. For now though, what I'm interested in doing is just checking off all of these items because at this point we've finally wrapped up the process of not only registering a new user account within our Netflix clone, but of course at the same time being able to create a new subscription, which is going to be essential for any streaming product that you create. As we power through the list of features in my checklist today, I actually just wanna skip ahead a few steps for the sake of our tutorial and focus on building out one of the first real core user-facing features, which is going to be the process of designing the Netflix homepage. Now, I hope you're ready because this is going to be a big module. There's a whole lot of new concepts that I'm going to introduce that are going to build on top of all of the existing knowledge that we have. But of course, it's nothing that we can't handle inside of Bubble. And look, I'm keen to just dive right into this one. So what we're gonna do is open up our Bubble editor then over in our editor, we're gonna open up our index page. Now, as I previously mentioned, by default, every application will come with an index page. This is the home page of your app. And at this point in time, this page should be blank. So in an ideal world today, we're gonna to go from this blank white page and turn it into something like this. Now, it's certainly not gonna be as complex as the real world Netflix clone, but it's gonna have all of these same core features that you know and love. So if I'm to look at the real world Netflix product here, what I can see is that this page is broken down into a few core sections. At the very top of our page, we have this navigation menu. Now look, I'm gonna break that down into a separate module yet again. 
just because the process of creating a navigation menu entails quite a bit of detail. And so I'm gonna split that into a separate module so that way we don't have to overwhelm ourselves right now. But below that, at the very top of this page, we have this featured section where it displays a featured show as well as the title, a description, a play button. And then if we scroll on down, you'll see all of these additional shows and movies, which are all grouped together by a category. And so all of this can easily be replicated inside a bubble. So what we're gonna do is first of all, jump back to our bubble editor. We're gonna double click on the page. And the very first thing we'll need to do, if you remember, is set a container layout on this page. So that way we can determine in which order elements should be placed on our page. So if we head over to our layout tab, we're gonna set the container layout to be a column because as you saw on this page, we're gonna be stacking elements from top to bottom. At the very top of our page, we have the navigation menu, then we have the featured section, and then we have all of these lists of content that are going to be shown. And so that's why we're gonna be stacking elements from top to bottom, which of course means that we need to use the column container layer. I'm then gonna jump over to my appearance tab, and I'm gonna set the background color of this page to be black. And then finally from here, we can start to build out the hero section at the top of our page. And so if I take a look at this hero section, in my opinion, it's kind of separate to everything else on the page. So the way I interpret this is that this is like a group on our page, which contains a few different elements. So in that group, we have a background image, which is this featured show or movie. Then inside of that group, we have the text, which is the actual show name, as well as the description for the show, and then this play button. So what I'm gonna do is add a group onto my page, which is going to be a container. And then I'm gonna add all of those elements that I just explained. So if we jump into bubble here, I'm gonna scroll on down to my containers menu and I'm gonna grab a group here. Now, when it comes to this group, the first thing I'd like to do is give this a type of content. And this is going to be a new concept if you've never used Bubble before. So not only are groups powerful because they act as containers where you can store additional elements inside of them, but another superpower to groups is that you can actually send and store data inside of them. So for instance, if we look at the real world Netflix product, this group here is storing the information of this particular show. And then all of the elements inside of this group are referencing the information of that show. And so if we jump back into Bubble, you'll see when it comes to a group element under your appearance tab, the very first setting here allows you to store a type of content inside of this group. And what we can do is reference the data type known as our content. Now, if you remember from the module where we set up our database, in our Netflix clone today, I'm just referring to TV shows and movies as content. So if something is a TV show or a movie, it's gonna be one piece of content. And look, now because I've set a type of content in this group, I have the ability to give this a data source. And this is where you're gonna really start to see the power of Bubble come to life. One of the key difference between Bubble and other no-code platforms is that it allows you to create what's known as dynamic applications. And you're gonna hear me use that D word a lot throughout our build today. But of course, what on earth does it mean to have a dynamic application? If you've ever used website builders in the past, like Wix, WordPress, or Webflow, as website builders, they allow you to create what's known as static websites. So these are websites where you build it once and it will always look the same every single time you load it. So that's why it's called static, it does not change. Whereas in Bubble, you're able to create dynamic applications. So that means that every single time someone loads this application, we could display a different featured piece of content. And if you really wanted, you could create something like a small algorithm, which caters that piece of content to a particular user's interests. And so that's why Bubble is by far one of the most powerful no-code tools on the market. It truly allows you to create unique applications for every single user in your app. And look, part of the ability of creating a dynamic application is the ability to dynamically pull data from your database. And so that's why you see this option here to have a data source. So if I was to open up this data source, I could perform a search in my database and display a piece of content to a user. And today what I'm gonna do is actually randomize the piece of content that's displayed to every single user. So every single time they open up this homepage, this piece of content displayed in our feature group is going to be different. It could be a TV show, it could be a movie. The options truly are endless. So what we're gonna do is perform a search in our database and pull out a random piece of content. So I'm going to perform a search for all of the content in my database which at this point in time, I haven't explained how we can create content. So there is currently no content to reference, but once we're able to create that, Bubble will automatically start populating this group. 
Now, when I'm searching for a piece of content, I don't just wanna pull out any old piece of content. Instead, I wanna make sure that the piece of content I'm referencing is currently published in my app. So if you remember in my data tab here, under our content data type, we had this field known as is published, and this was set to a yes, no value where the default value was no. So when you're creating a show later on on the admin portal of your app, which only you will be able to access, by default, a show is not going to be published because of course you might be adding details to it while you're creating it. So it's only going to be when you as the admin determine that this piece of content should be published and accessible that this value will switch over to yes. And so what I wanna do is just make sure that when we're searching for the content here, I only wanna reference pieces of content where the is published status currently equals yes, meaning that this content should be accessible to anyone within your Netflix clone. What I'm also then gonna do is choose to sort all of the pieces of content that we're searching for in a random order. So that way, every single time someone refreshes this page, the piece of content is going to be different. Now, one thing I should point out is that right now we're performing a search for all of the content in our database where the published status is yes. And of course, if you've uploaded more than one TV show or movie, it's going to be a long list of all of the content that you could display. Whereas in this case, I only wanna reference one item and display it within my hero group here. So what we're gonna do is after this search where we're pulling a random list of content, I'm gonna select this more option and I'm going to display the first item within that list. And because that list is going to be randomly assorted every single time this page is loaded, the first item will always be different. And so that means that we're going to randomly show a piece of content in our hero section. And each piece of content is going to get, let's say an even amount of distribution because it's going to be randomly displayed. Now, because we've taken the time to give this group a data source, and we know that we're going to be displaying one piece of content inside of this group, we can start to add in all of our additional elements here which can reference the details of that piece of content. So things like the thumbnail image, the title and the description. So what we're gonna do for this group is scroll on down to the background style. And for this background style, I'm gonna actually set this to be an image. And when it comes to this image, I'd like to display the thumbnail image for this piece of content. So if you look at Netflix right now, this could be the thumbnail image for this particular show. So I wanna display that in the entire background of this group. So in order to reference that, you could insert dynamic data. And if you were to scroll on down to your elements option here, you could reference the group content. So this is the name of the group that we're currently working in. And perhaps I could even give this a better name. I could call this something like group hero content. So that way it's a bit more obvious. Then you'll see here that we have the ability to reference the group hero content, which of course within this group, it has a data source which is storing one piece of content. So I can reference that piece of content. And now you'll see that because I'm referencing one item within my database, I can pull and display any information from all of the data fields under that piece of content. And of course there is a data field known as the thumbnail image. And so now this background here is going to be a thumbnail image. Now, another thing I should also point out is that when it comes to working with dynamic images, and again, what Bubble means by dynamic is that this image is always going to change. It's not just a static image where you upload one specific image and that image is what's always going to be displayed. Instead, when it comes to this dynamic image, it's always going to display the thumbnail image of that one piece of random content that's displayed inside of this group. And look, I apologize if I sound a bit repetitive, but I really just wanna make sure that you understand this. And the reason for that is because this is one of the main concepts that you're gonna hear me use time and time again while we're building our app inside a bubble. But one thing I like to do as a personal preference, and this isn't essential, is that when I'm working with dynamic images, because each image is always going to be a different size because we're using different images, what I wanna do is ensure that the image is cropped and expanded out to take up all of the space of this group. So what you can do is choose this additional option here to process an image with MGIX, and you can check this box here to resize and fit the dimensions by cropping them, which as the name would suggest, just ensures that the image will be expanded out and cropped to take up the entire width and height of this group here, regardless of whatever size this group may be. And look, this is a setting you're gonna see me use time and time again as well, but that truly is just a personal preference of mine. And they're gonna to choose to close this. Now, although this is the exact data source you will need to use for this group, you might notice that when I click away from this group, we can't actually see it on our page right now. 
And that's because while we're building our app inside of our bubble editor, we don't actually have an image for it to display. It's only when you run a preview of your app and when you actually have a piece of content to load into this group that it's going to display that background image. So while I'm working inside of my app, something I personally like to do is just upload a static background image. And the reason for that is because it's just going to automatically display an image that will not change. But of course, it's then going to remove my dynamic data source here. So I do just wanna point out that if you do upload a static image while you're working on your app, when you go to preview or publish your app, you'll need to make sure you remove that static image and then refer back to this exact dynamic image data source here. So I'm just gonna upload a static image that I have on my local device. And look, I've also taken the time to upload this into the Google Drive that you will have access to. And so when I upload my static image, as you'll see, it will remove my dynamic image data source. So before I preview my app, once again, I really just wanna highlight that you will need to take the time to remove the static image and update that. But as you'll now see, while we're working inside of our editor, we can now see where this group actually sits because it has a static background image. Now this background image is just a Stranger Things thumbnail, but it's just going to allow you to actually see where everything sits on your page. So after adding in this background image, we're gonna jump over to our layout tab because I want this group to take up the full width of my page. But before we do that, we need to give this group a container layout because of course groups are like small pages within your overall page. And of course, when it comes to this group, if we look at the real world Netflix product, as I mentioned before, we're gonna to want to add in the title of this piece of content, the description, as well as a play button. And all of these elements are stacked on top of each other. So they're scaled vertically down our page, which means when it comes to the container layout, I'm gonna set this to be a column. Then from here, we can scroll on down to our width settings, and we're gonna make this take up the entire width of our page. So I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width, I will then set the minimum width to be zero and leave the maximum width as infinite, which means that this group can now take up as little or as much space as it needs on my page. And now the other thing I'd like to do while we're here is actually just update the height. As you can see, the height of this group is quite narrow. So it's cutting off a lot of our image. So what I'm gonna do is set the minimum height here to be 500 pixels, which means that at any given point in time, this group will be this exact height or higher because the maximum height is infinite. So if for some reason you have, let's say a piece of content with a really long description and it needs to push this group down in order to fit into it. What this just means is that this group will continually expand down, but at any given point in time, it won't be any smaller than this exact size you see here, which is 500 pixels in height. And look, as you can see now, this is starting to take shape on our page. Now inside of this group, we can start to add all of our elements that we're going to display for this featured piece of content. And the very first element is just going to be the title. So if I head to my visual elements here, I'm gonna grab a text element and add this into my group. Now, when it comes to this text element, I'm gonna to want to display the title of the current piece of content that's being featured. So I'm gonna insert dynamic data. And once again, I'm gonna reference that D word, dynamic, because this text is always just going to change and display the title of whatever show is randomly being displayed in our hero section. And when it comes to this text, I'm gonna scroll on down and reference the group hero content the piece of content stored in the data source of that group. And then once again, I can reference all of the data fields for that piece of content. So I'm gonna reference the title here. Then once we've set out the dynamic data source, we can scroll on down and detach the default style because I'd like to make some one-off changes to this heading. I'm gonna make the font size here 36. So it's gonna be quite large. I'm also gonna set the font color to be white and I'm going to bold this text. I'll then need to make this fully responsive so that way it scales across the full width of my page. So I'll jump over to my layout tab. I will unselect that this should be a fixed width. And if I set the minimum width to zero and leave the maximum width as infinite, it's gonna take up as little or as much space as it needs on my page. I'm then going to jump over to my minimum height. I'm gonna set this to be zero. And because we have this option selected by default to fit the height of this element to the content inside of it, it's just going to ensure that this text element will collapse around all of the text inside of it there. Then finally, while we're working in our layout tab, I'm just gonna add in 200 pixels of margin at the top, 50 pixels of margin on the left, and 50 pixels of margin on the right. And that's just going to ensure that this text element won't touch the borders of my actual group that it sits within. 
Then below this, I'm going to add yet another text element, and that's going to contain the description of this featured piece of content. And look, to streamline that process, I'm just going to make a copy of my existing text element here. Only of course, when it comes to our dynamic data source, instead of displaying the title for this show, what I'd like to do is just update this data field and display the description. Then I'm going to head on down to my font size. I'll set this to be 20, so that way this is smaller than our main heading. And then I'll also just need to update the margin here because there's quite a bit of margin that we've copied across on the top of this element. So if we jump to our layout tab, what I'm going to do is just set the top margin here to be 20 instead of 200. And then finally below this, there's one last element I'd like to add. And in this case, I'm just going to add this play button here. Now inside of this play button, you can see there's two elements. There's this little play icon as well as the text element. And that's going to lead to a little bit of a problem inside of Bubble. So if I was to grab a button element and add this into our application, when it comes to buttons inside of Bubble, you're only able to add text into these. So I could easily have this display the word play, but we don't have that little icon. And look, if you're super pedantic like I am, we're not gonna settle for that. Instead, what we're gonna do is add both the icon and the text element beside each other. So how can we do that? What you can actually do in Bubble is create a custom button using a group element. So groups also have another superpower to them. They truly are gonna be your best friend throughout any app that you create. But if I was to select on, let's say my main group, so my group hero content, what you'll also see is that we have the ability to add a workflow whenever a group is clicked. So you can see here, whenever someone clicks on my hero group, I can run a workflow. So that means that I could create a group that looks like a button and contains two elements inside of it. Then when that button is clicked, we could run a workflow, which is obviously gonna start streaming this piece of content. So what I'm gonna do is delete this button here. I'm gonna scroll on down to my containers menu. I'm gonna grab a group element and I'll add this into my existing group. So right now we have a group inside of our group. Now, when it comes to this group, the first thing I'm gonna do is scroll on down and detach the default style of this because I'd like to update the background style to be a flat color and I'm gonna leave this as white. I'm also then just going to update the roundness of its borders to be 10, so that way it has some curved edges. And then when it comes to the elements we're gonna add inside of this group, I'd obviously like to position them side by side. So I can see there is a little play icon followed by some text which displays the word play. And so when it comes to this group, I can see we have two elements stacked side by side, so horizontally which means that within our layout tab, we're gonna need to set the container layout to be a row because that obviously allows us to position two elements directly side by side. Now, when it comes to this group, before we add those elements inside of it, I'm just gonna quickly update the height and width of this. I'm gonna set this group to be 150 pixels in width and I'm gonna keep this as a fixed value. And the reason for that is because if I didn't have this as a fixed value, this group would take up as much space as it could on my page. Whereas I actually only ever want this group to be one exact size and that is 150 pixels. Now the reason why I selected 150 pixels is because I just think that's enough space there. There's no scientific reason behind it. I just think that that's plenty of space to add both an icon and a text element. And as a fixed width here, it will always be this size. I'm then gonna do the exact same thing for the height of this group. So I'm actually gonna select to make this a fixed height and I'm gonna set this height to be 50 pixels. And once again, I've selected 50 pixels because I think that that kind of is the same shape as a real world button. And as a fixed height, it will always be this exact size. Then from here, before we add in all of our margins, we're gonna build out the elements that will be displayed inside of this group. So as I mentioned, the first thing we'll add is an icon element. So if we head to our visual elements, I'm gonna grab an icon, I will add it into this group and I'm just gonna type in the word play and I'm gonna grab this play icon. Then from here, I'm gonna update the color of this icon. I'm gonna make this a custom shade of black that I have. If you'd like this color code, it's 3E3E3E. Then from here, we're gonna jump over to our layout tab. And look, to be honest, when it comes to the dimensions of this icon, I'm quite happy to leave it as the default options. So this is 30 pixels in width and 30 pixels in height. And you'll notice that both of these values are fixed meaning that this icon will always be this exact size, no larger and no smaller. What I am gonna do while we're here though is just update the vertical alignment of this icon. So I'm gonna position this in the center of my container, which is the white group that you see here. Then I'm also just gonna add in 30 pixels of margin on the left, 
just to push it a little more inside of my group. Then beside this icon, I'm gonna grab a text element and this will just display the words play. And look, when it comes to this text element, I'm gonna scroll on down. I'll detach the default style of this. I'll update the font size to be 22 pixels. I'm gonna to choose to bold this text and I'm gonna update the font color to be the exact same color as the icon. So once again, that's 3E, 3E, 3E. I'll then jump over to my layout tab because of course we've got all of this empty width that we don't need here. So when it comes to this text element, I'm gonna unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'm gonna set the minimum width to be zero, but when it comes to the maximum width, I'm not gonna leave this as infinite. Instead, what I'm gonna do is tick this option to fit the width of this element to the content inside of it. So now it's going to collapse perfectly around the width of all of the text there. I'm gonna do the exact same thing for our height. So I'm gonna set the height here to be zero. And once again, it's gonna collapse around that text. Then finally, I will update the vertical alignment of this text element to be in the center of my white group. And look, while we're here, I might also just add in five pixels of margin on the left, just to ensure that we have some space between both of these elements. Then from here, we can select on the overall group. So I'm gonna call this our group play button. And of course, it's important to update this because later on, we're gonna trigger a workflow whenever this button is clicked. And when it comes to the margins of this group, I'm just gonna add in 20 pixels of margin at the top, 50 on the left, and then 50 on the right. And just like that, that is how we can build out the featured piece of content section on our Netflix homepage. So you can start to see right now that this page is slowly coming together. But right now, what I'd like to do below this is add in a list of all of the pieces of content that someone can select from. And of course, these are going to be broken down into different categories. And just when you thought you were starting to get your head around all of the core concepts within Bubble, I'm about to shake up your world once again, because there is another very important element we're gonna start using when it comes to displaying these list of items. But before we add that list in, we have to first of all, just start adding in our headings here. So I'm gonna jump over into our Bubble Editor. I'm gonna grab a text element and we're gonna add this below our group here. So this is now going to sit outside of our featured group. So this is going to be directly on our page. Now, when it comes to this heading, I'm just gonna add in a series of static text which is just going to display a list of core categories I'd like to filter content by on my homepage. So you can see right now on Netflix, it has this trending section. It also will normally have things like popular, comedy, action, drama. And so I'm just gonna choose a couple of key categories that I'd like to display on my Netflix homepage. But of course you can mix these up to whatever categories you would like. So if I jump over to my bubble editor, the first category I'm gonna add is gonna be called feel good comedy. Then I'm gonna scroll on down to the styling of this heading. I'm gonna detach the default style. I'll update the font size to be 20. I'll also update the font color to be white. So we can now easily see it on our page. And then I'm gonna to choose to bold this text here. So that way it stands out like a heading. We'll then need to update the responsive settings for this text element. So if we jump over to our layout tab, of course I will unselect that this should be a fixed width and I'm gonna make this fully responsive. So I'm gonna set the minimum width to zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. So now this text element can take up as little or as much space as it needs on my page. Then while we're here, I'm also gonna update the minimum height to be zero. And of course, because we have this default option selected to fit the height of this element to the content inside of it, it will collapse nicely around all of that text. And then finally, while we're here, I'm just gonna add in 30 pixels of margin at the top, 20 on the left, and then 20 on the right. Now below this, we're gonna start adding in all of the lists of pieces of content that we should show within each category. But before I do that, what I wanna do is just expand the height of my page because I can see we're running out of space here. So I'm just gonna quickly double click on my page, which is my index element. And when it comes to the minimum height, I'm just gonna quickly update this to be something like 1200. Now we can of course come back and update this when we go to actually preview or publish our app. But for the time being, this is just going to give me a little bit more space to work within. Now inside of our bubble app, this is where things are gonna to start to get really interesting. So already what we've done on this page is we know how to display one piece of content in a group. But what happens when we need to display a long list of pieces of content? Thankfully in bubble, there is a specific element that allows you to do that. And it is known as a repeating group. So as the name would suggest, this is just going to add a long list of groups onto your page. 
And when you add this onto your page, because our background is currently black, you can't really see all of the different cells. But what you can see is all of the headings for each cell. So right now, a repeating group kind of just looks like a big spreadsheet on our page. It's got a bunch of different cells and each one of these is its own individual group. Now, the reason why repeating groups are so important inside a bubble is because they allow you to display a dynamic list of things from your database. And what do I mean by that? A great example would be if we were creating our own Instagram clone. And let's say we want to build out the homepage of Instagram where we want a feed of all of the Instagram posts. So we're going to have some photos some videos, some reels and so on. Now, if you were trying to build out that homepage where you've got a long list of content that you can scroll through, a repeating group is the exact element you would use to bring that to life. So a repeating group allows you to dynamically pull posts from your database and you can cater those to whatever user preferences you have. So once again, you can create your own sort of algorithm which dynamically displays different posts to each user based on their own taste. And today what we're going to do is dynamically display a list of all of the pieces of content in our database that are related to the comedy category. Then we're going to create another list and we're going to display all of the content related to the drama category. And so whenever you want to display a list of elements or data inside of your bubble app, you will need to use a repeating group. So we're going to use them throughout pretty much every page in our app today. And I'm going to try and explain things in as much detail as I can along the way, just because I know that when you're new to Bubble, repeating groups can be a little bit confusing to get your head around. But the first thing you need to do with any repeating group is give it a data source, because it needs to know which list of items from your database it should pull out and display. So if we jump over to our appearance tab here, similar to a group element, we have this ability to give it a type of content in a data source. So when it comes to the type of content here, we're going to actually display a piece of content from our database because once again, the content is known as our TV show or movie. It's all under that one umbrella. Then from here, we're going to perform a search in our database for all of these specific pieces of content that have a category, which is comedy. So when we're performing this search, we're going to search for all of the content in our database where first of all, the status of this piece of content is published. So where the is published status equals yes. And then from here, I'm going to add what's known as another constraint, which a constraint just refines what content is going to be displayed inside of this repeating group. So it's kind of like a filter. And I'm also going to reference only the pieces of content in our database where the genres, which if you remember in our database under our content data type, we had the genres data field, which was a list of genres. So we also had an option set, which had all of our genres in it. So every single time you create a piece of content, whether it be a TV show or a movie, as an admin, you're going to have the ability to add a bunch of different genres to it. And so right now we only want to display the content where the genres contains the comedy category. So within our design tab, I'm going to open up my data source once again, and we're going to only display content where the genres contains within that list, the category, which is comedy. And that is all we'll need to add when it comes to these constraints. Now, what I'd also like to do is update the way that we're sorting these pieces of content. I'm going to sort these in a random order. So that way, whenever someone loads this page, it's going to shuffle around all of the pieces of content within this category. It's not just going to display the exact same list each time. And that is everything we need to add for our search on our data source. But if this is returning a list of all of the pieces of content that are first of all published and that second of all contain the category, which is comedy, if we have, let's say, a thousand different pieces of content, it's going to load that entire list. And that's not really the experience I want to create today. And the reason for that is because if we're loading a thousand items, that's going to take our application a very long time to do that. So it's going to start to slow our app down. So what I want to do is instead only load the first 20 items within this category. And the way I can do this is by selecting the more option here. And from this list of items that Bubble's going to return for my search, what I can do is scroll on down and only display the items until and then you'll see we have a number. And if I just type in the number 20, it's only going to display the first 20 items within that list. So that's just going to ensure that it breaks the search down to the very first 20 items. So that way Bubble doesn't slow itself down. Now, by all means, you can update this to whatever number you want, whether it be 30, 50, but please just try and add a limit to this. Because if you don't, as I mentioned, Bubble will literally search and display 
every single piece of content that matches that genre. Now from here, we're gonna need to update the number of rows and columns, but before we do that, I just wanna quickly update the border color for this repeating group because we can't really see where it sits on our page. So the first thing I'm gonna do is update these separators here. So if I set this to be white, you can now see that we have these lines between each of our repeating group cells. And perhaps I could update the width of this to be something like two, so that way it is slightly more visible. Now, when you go to preview or publish your app, you'll most likely want to remove these lines. So you can just set these as none. But for the time being, while we're working inside of our editor, I think it's important to see where each individual group sits inside of our entire list. I'm then gonna scroll on down and attach the default style because I'd also like to update the border here to be white. And if I really wanted, I could set this to be two as well. So that way when I click away, I can easily see where each group sits in my repeating group list. And of course, once again, you'll most likely remove this border when you go to publish your app. But for the time being, we need to make this as easy as possible while we're bringing this to life. I'm then going to select on my repeating group. I'm gonna scroll on up to my number of rows and columns. And this is where things are going to get a little confusing. I remember when I first started working with repeating groups in Bubble, it took me a while to get my head around this. But in order for me to explain this, I should perhaps open up the Real World Netflix product and just once again, show you how this is currently built. So right now I can see a list of all of the different shows in what looks like a repeating group on Netflix's homepage. Now, all of these shows are scaled horizontally across the page. So you have the ability to continually scroll horizontally across to view more pieces of content. And so in order to create this experience, we need to create what's known as a horizontal repeating group, which just means, as I just suggested, you can scroll horizontally across your page, not vertically. So back to my analogy before, if you were creating an Instagram clone, you'd wanna scroll vertically through that repeating group. Whereas in this case, we wanna create a horizontal repeating group. Now, in my opinion, when it comes to creating horizontal repeating groups, they're a little bit more confusing to get your head around than creating vertical repeating groups. And look, it is a bit of a shame that we do have to create a horizontal repeating group first. I do traditionally like to explain how we can create one of those vertical repeating groups, just cause it's much easier to understand if you are new to bubble. But look, I'm gonna try and explain everything you need to know without trying to overcomplicate anything in the process. So if we jump back into Bubble, in order to get access to that horizontal feature, what we need to do is unselect the number of rows and the number of columns that are being displayed within this repeating group. And so perhaps I should illustrate what these do first. Right now, if we were searching through our database for all of the pieces of content that are related to comedy and we're displaying up to 20 items, we still wouldn't be able to display all 20 items because right now the number of rows here is fixed at four. So this repeating group is only going to display the first four items. So traditionally, I'll always unselect this option because of course the purpose of a repeating group is to display a long list of items. You don't ever just wanna display the first four. But right now you can also see that this repeating group is still positioned vertically. So all of these cells are stacked on top of each other. And that's because the number of columns is fixed as one. So all of our repeating groups only have one column and then they're gonna be positioned vertically on top of each other. So if I was to unselect this option, what you'll now see is that we have this scroll direction menu. And if we open this, we can reference that horizontal scroll that I mentioned. And the only way you can get access to this scroll direction is by unselecting both of those fields there. Then from here, what I'm gonna do is jump over to my layout tab, and I'm just gonna update the width of my repeating group quickly. So as you can see, the width of the actual repeating group itself is at a fixed value of 280 pixels. Whereas I actually want this width to take up the entire width of my page. But before we do that, what I'm gonna do is give this a container layout. So as I mentioned, a repeating group, as the name would suggest, is just a long list of groups. So all of these groups are like mini pages inside of your app. And now when it comes to each of our groups, today we're only gonna add one element inside of it. And so if I look at the real world Netflix product, each group just has an image inside of it, which is this background image there. And so it doesn't really matter what you set as the container layout because you're only gonna add one element into it. You don't need to stack anything vertically or horizontally, but I'm personally just gonna select the row option here. But again, it doesn't matter what you select here. I'm then going to make this repeating group fully responsive. So if I unselect that this should be a fixed width, 
I'm going to set the minimum width to be zero and leave the maximum width is infinite. So now it's going to take up as little or as much space as it needs on my page. I'm also going to come back and update the minimum height in a moment. But before we do that, we need to add our element inside of our repeating group. Now, if we jump back over to our appearance tab, as you can see right now, each cell of our repeating group is quite small. And that's because by default, it has a minimum height of each row of 100 pixels and a minimum width of each column of also 100 pixels. And so this is where things can get a little bit confusing for repeating groups. And so I personally still find that when it comes to these settings here, it's normally just a matter of trial and error. So in order to get the perfect dimensions of each square or cell inside of your repeating group, you'll often just need to tinker around with these settings, add your elements into it, and then come back and make some changes again. But one thing I can tell you for sure right now is that when it comes to the minimum width of each column, I'm gonna set this to be 320 pixels. And I'm sure you're probably wondering, Lachlan, why on earth did you choose 320 pixels? Look, unlike everything else in our tutorial today, there is a specific reason why I chose this. And the best way to illustrate this is by jumping over to our responsive menu here. Now, as you can see at the top of our responsive tab here, we have all of the default sizes for all of the different devices that users could access your Netflix clone through. So we've got things like a desktop, a tablet, and then a mobile device. And all of these dimensions here are the smallest possible sizes in which someone could use on these device types. So at the smallest possible desktop browser size, someone will be viewing this at 1200 pixels. But the main thing I'm interested in showing you right now is the smallest possible mobile device size. And as you can see, that is 320 pixels. Now, what device would be roughly 320 pixels? If you're currently living in the Stone Age and you have something like an iPhone 5, the width of that screen size is 320 pixels. Where something more modern like an iPhone 14 or a 15, I tend to find is about the 380 or sometimes even up to 440 pixels. But of course, as a developer, we need to cater for everyone on the smallest possible devices. And so that's why when it comes to creating truly responsive experiences, when you break a page down to a smaller size, 320 pixels is the minimum width that you need to cater for. So as you can see at 320 pixels, this just ensures that my list will stack on top of each other. So it's creating a truly responsive experience on the smallest possible device size. But of course, as I expand my page out, my repeating group will automatically add some additional cells. And so as I mentioned before, I know for a fact that the minimum width of each column here should be 320 pixels. But the thing I'm not sure about is the minimum height of each row. So what I'm gonna do is just choose a random number here. I'm gonna say that this should be 200 pixels. Now there is no scientific reason why I selected that. I just think that that's enough space to display an image. However, I am gonna come back and once I've added my image, I'll know what size to set this as. And so this is what I mean about these two settings here, sometimes being a matter of trial and error. So if we jump over to our UI builder, what we're gonna do is add an image element inside of our repeating group. So if we head to our visual elements, I'm gonna grab an image, I'll add this into my repeating group. And when it comes to this image, I'm gonna to need to insert a dynamic image data source. And so of course, what I mean by dynamic is that this image should change based on the piece of content within each repeating group cell. So let's say if we're performing a search through our database for all of the pieces of content that are related to comedy, and we're displaying the first 20 items. In cell number one here, it's going to display the very first piece of content within that list. In cell number two, it will display the second piece of content. In cell number three, it will be the third piece of content and so on. And so we want each image to pull out the relevant thumbnail based on whatever piece of content is within each cell. So that means that every image is going to be different it will be dynamic. And so if we insert dynamic data, what we're gonna reference is the current cell's content. And so what that means is that for cell number one, which is a piece of content, it's going to reference its particular data. In cell number two, it will reference that cell's particular data. So each cell has a different piece of content, which is why we're gonna reference the current cell's content. And then from here, because our content is a data type, we can reference any data field within that. And of course, I'm gonna reference the thumbnail image. Because this is also a dynamic image, I'm gonna to choose to process this with Imgex, just so I can tick this option to resize and fit the dimensions by cropping them. And that of course just means that each image is going to scale out and take up as much space as it can inside of our image element. I'm then gonna to choose to close this data source. And while we're working on this image, I'm just gonna scroll on down and detach the default style of this. And the reason for that is because I'm gonna give this a solid border 
and I'm gonna make this border a shade of white. Now, once again, I'm only doing this in the preview of my editor here, so that way I know while I'm creating my app that this is where our images lie. But of course, when you go to publish your app, you could probably just remove that, so that way your end users don't see these white borders. And they're gonna jump over to my layout tab, and this is where we can update and set the dimensions of each image here. And now when it comes to our image here, I can currently see that it's set at a fixed value of 320 pixels. So this just means that this image is going to take up the entire width of each repeating group cell. Because if you remember, our repeating group cell had that minimum width of 320 pixels as well. But what I'm actually gonna do is set this width here to be 300 pixels. And there is a particular reason why I selected that. And I'll explain that in a moment. But what I'm also gonna do while we're here is just quickly tick this option to keep this elements aspect ratio fixed. And I'm gonna set this as a two to one ratio. So that way this particular image will always be a perfect rectangle. So it means that the width will be 320 pixels. And then if the height is half the width, the height will always be 150 pixels. While we're here, I'm then also going to add 10 pixels of margin around every single border. And that is why I've set the width here fixed at 300 pixels. Because if the minimum width of our repeating group cell is 320 pixels, and in terms of the width, if I have 10 pixels of margin on each side of this image, it's 300 pixels in width plus 10 plus 10, that's gonna equal 320. So you can see when it comes to creating responsive experience, you just need to cater things around that 320 mark. And you're gonna see me do that quite a bit throughout our tutorial today. Now, while we're here, I'm also just gonna vertically align this image in the center of our repeating group. And then if I select on our repeating group itself, I'm just gonna update the container alignment. Now the container alignment just determines of all of the elements inside of each group where they should be positioned. And once again, I'm just gonna make sure that this is centered. Now it probably won't make any significant difference, but I just wanna make sure I'm centering everything both vertically and horizontally. And the reason why this container alignment is scaling things horizontally is of course because our container layout is a row which scales things side by side or horizontally. Now from here, after adding our image into the repeating group, which is the only element we're gonna add into it, we just need to make a few last changes to the repeating group. So right now, if I was to close my property editor, as you can see, this repeating group is still scaling down the entire height of my page. I'm sure you're probably thinking, Lachlan, this is a horizontal repeating group. So why is it scaled vertically? If I was to double click on my repeating group and open up my layout tab, as you can see right now, the minimum height of our repeating group is currently 350 pixels, which means that at any given time, the minimum height is 350 pixels, which is this entire height that you see here. And so by having this as 350 pixels, and of course our image only being 170 pixels in height, because of course, if the image height is half the width, 150 pixels, plus 10 pixels of margin on the top and 10 on the bottom, that gives us 170 pixels. We then have a bit of room to display some additional cells because we've got all this extra height to play with. So what I'm gonna do is actually tick this option to make this element a fixed height. And I'm gonna set this as 170 pixels. And of course, the reason for that is because as I just mentioned, the height of this image plus the margin around it is going to be 170 pixels. But as you can see right now, our image currently isn't really aligned within our repeating group. It's getting cut off. And the reason for that is because if I select on my repeating group one last time, I'm gonna jump to my appearance tab and you might remember that the minimum height of each row we set was 200 pixels. And once again, this is what I mean about that whole trial and error experience. Because I now know that the height of my repeating group cell should be 170 pixels, I can update that and our image will fit in this perfectly. And look, the only way I learned how to do this is truly by practice and trial and error. Please don't be overwhelmed if you found this whole process confusing. Although I have tried to explain things in as much detail as I can, I do completely understand if the whole concepts of repeating groups, particularly horizontal scrolling repeating groups, are hard to understand. And look, as I mentioned, vertical repeating groups are nowhere near this hard to configure. But what you'll find when you're creating a Netflix clone is that every repeating group is horizontal. So unfortunately, you're out of luck. You're gonna to need to learn how to actually build a horizontal repeating group. But thankfully, that is absolutely everything we need to build out for this repeating group. What I'm gonna do is just jump to my layout tab and move this to the next position on my page. 
And if I click away, this repeating group is now going to display a list of all of the pieces of content that are related to comedy. And although you can only see three cells right here, this will continually just expand horizontally across my page. So even if it cuts off, a user could easily just scroll horizontally through this like the real world Netflix product. Now below this, what I'm gonna do is make a copy of both my heading and my repeating group element. And instead of displaying all of the content related to comedy, I'm gonna pick another category. So I'm just gonna select on my text element as well as the repeating group itself. I'll make a copy of these. I'll then just paste this onto my page. And let's say for this category, I'd like to display the genre, which is action. So I'm just gonna update my heading to display the word action. I can then select on my repeating group and if I wanna update this list of pieces of content to display action shows or movies, what I can do is just open up my search here and all I need to do is update the genre. So instead of displaying the genres which contains comedy, I'm just going to display the genres which contains action. I can then choose to close this. And one last thing I just wanted to show you is how you could display a particular row which is just related to TV shows. So if for instance, I was to copy my heading and paste this in, what you could do is update this to display TV series. Then I could make one last copy of my repeating group. And within my search here, what I could do is add a constraint and I could display all of the pieces of content where the content type equals either a movie or a TV show. Because once again, in my data tab here, under our content data type, we had a data field known as the content type, which of course was linked to our option set which was also a content type, which had these two options inside of it. So a movie and a TV show. And so what you can do is reference all of the content where the content type is a TV show. And if you wanna display any TV show, you can remove the genre here. But if you wanna also filter this out even further, so you could say action TV shows or family TV shows, you can play around with all of the settings here. And look, you can add as many of these repeating groups as you would like. But for the sake of our tutorial today, I'm just gonna add these three. I'm gonna keep it super straightforward. So I'm just gonna remove this genre here and display all of my TV shows. And look, that is everything we'll need to build out in terms of the design of our homepage. As you can see, we've taken quite a bit of time, but our Netflix clone is really starting to come together quite nicely. Unfortunately, if you were to run a preview of this page though, you're not gonna see much on it. All you're gonna see is the static image that we've uploaded here, which in reality shouldn't really be here. Because remember, as I mentioned, when you go to preview your app, you should also update this to be the dynamic image once again. But as I also mentioned, you won't see anything in our repeating groups. And the reason for that is because we haven't yet built out the feature which allows us to create new content in our database. But once we do start creating content, these will automatically populate with all of the relevant content. Now, the only other thing I just wanna build out on our homepage is just a quick workflow that's gonna make sure that only users who are signed into an account can view this homepage. So we don't want anyone who's not a registered user to actually be able to view any of this content. And so that way, if someone is not logged into their account, what I wanna do is redirect them back through to our user registration page, where they'll be prompted to create a new account. And the way we can do this is by jumping over to our workflow tab. And if we create a brand new workflow from scratch, under your general option, you're gonna see the ability to create a workflow every single time the page is loaded. And within this workflow, what we're gonna do is head to our navigation events, choose the go to page action, and we're gonna send someone through to our registration page, as I mentioned. But of course, I only want this workflow to run if someone is not logged into an account. I don't want someone who is logged in to automatically be redirected, because of course that person should have access to view all of this content. So what I'm gonna do is select on my workflow trigger and I'm gonna add a condition on this. Now conditions are another powerful feature inside a bubble that just allow you to create some sort of rules when certain behavior is met. So as an example, I only want this workflow to run when a user is not logged in. So I can select to add a condition here and have this workflow trigger run only when the current user, so the current user is the person viewing your app inside of their browser or their phone. And if I scroll on down, you'll see the option to reference when the current user is logged out, meaning they don't have an account. In which case, what this is gonna do is run this workflow and automatically send them back to our registration page. 
So that's how you can kind of gate all of the content to only members who are paid subscribers of your application. And look, just like that, that is everything we need to cover within this section of our tutorial today. So what we're gonna do is jump back to our Notion checklist and just check off that we've finished the first process of our homepage, which is just designing all of the core structure and elements which are going to help bring it to life. As we scroll down through the list of features within my checklist today, we're actually just going to divert away from any core user-facing features for a moment, and instead, we're gonna take the time to build out some of the backend experiences for admins of our Netflix app. So this is going to allow us to actually power the Netflix product. And so what I mean by that is we're going to create some pages that only you as the admin will be able to access in order to upload content that's going to be streamed on the Netflix product. Now, unfortunately, when it comes to these pages, because I'm not an actual admin of the real world Netflix product, I don't actually know how these pages look and function. So what I'm gonna to need to do is make a few rough assumptions as to what I think they look like, and we're gonna recreate them based on my own intuition here. And so within this first module here, we're actually just gonna take the time to build out an admin dashboard, which will just display a long list of all of the content within your Netflix database. So this is where you'll be able to view all of the content that you've uploaded. And of course, later on from here, we're gonna build out a feature that allows you to create and upload content as well as then of course be able to edit the details of existing content. So what we're gonna do is jump over into our bubble editor. Then within our bubble editor, what we're gonna do is open up our page dropdown menu and we're gonna create a brand new page from scratch. So I'm gonna select add a new page and we're gonna call this the dashboard page. Now look, as this is being created, what I'd like to do is just show you a brief example of what this page is going to look like before we build it out. So if I was to jump over into a separate browser here, you can see this is an example of a rough version of an admin dashboard that I've created. Now, once again, because I don't have access to the admin dashboard within the real world Netflix product, I'm unable to actually see what that looks like, but I imagine it might look something like this. So at the top of the page, we've just got the Netflix logo as well as a title, just telling you which page you're on. Then below that, we have a search bar which will just allow you to search for and pull up a specific show or movie. You have a button here, which when clicked, will send you to a page where you can create a new piece of content. And then below this, we have a repeating group, which is going to display a list of all of the content on your platform. And of course, later on, you'll be able to select this button here and make changes to that piece of content. And so as you can see, this page itself is fairly bare bones. Most of the heavy lifting today is gonna be built in the process of creating a new piece of content or editing an existing piece of content. But the purpose of this page is just to create a centralized dashboard where you can piece all of this together. So the first thing we're gonna build out on this page is just this header section here. And so if we jump back to our main bubble editor, the first thing I'll do is double click on the page. And of course, we'll just need to jump to our layout tab and update the container layout. Now, of course, as you saw, everything on this page was stacked from top to bottom, so vertically on our page, which means that the container layout will be a column. Now, on this page, we're not going to add our reusable navigation menu because in reality, the purpose of this page is that only you as the admin will be able to use and see it. And so it shouldn't really be connected with the rest of our Netflix product. That being said, we are gonna add a group at the top of our page. And within that group, as you saw, we're gonna stack two elements side by side. So that means we'll need to set the container layout of that group to be a row. So if I scroll on down to my containers here, I'm gonna grab a group, I'll add this onto my page. And the first thing I'll do for this group is jump over to my appearance tab, detach the default style of this, and I'm gonna give this a flat background color. And I'm gonna make this a light shade of red, so that way I can easily see where it sits on my page. From here, we'll then jump over to my layout tab. And as I mentioned, inside of this group, we're gonna add two elements which will be positioned side by side. So that means we're gonna need to set the container layout to be a row. I'll also make this group fully responsive by unselecting that this should be a fixed width, and I'll set the minimum width to be zero, and we'll leave the maximum width as infinite. Now inside of this group, I'm going to add a Netflix logo as well as a text element, which will act as a heading. So we'll start by adding in that Netflix logo. I'm gonna scroll on up to my visual elements. I'll grab an image, I'll add this in. And for this image, I'm just gonna upload a static image of the same Netflix logo I used in my reusable navigation menu. And once my image has loaded, we're gonna jump over to our layout tab and update the dimensions of this. 
I'm gonna set the width of this image to be 120 pixels. And I'm also gonna take this option to keep this elements aspect ratio fixed. And by default, it's going to set this as the actual ratio as the default image. Now I should also point out that I'm gonna leave the width of this image at a fixed value. And that's because I only ever want this to be 120 pixels, no larger and no smaller. While we're here, I'm also just going to vertically align this in the center of my red group. And that's all we'll need to change for this particular image. Beside this, we can then add in our text element. So under my visual elements, I'm gonna grab a text element here. I'll add this into my red group. And I'm just gonna have this display the words admin uploader. Then for this text, because this is going to be the main heading on our page, I'm just going to detach the default style of this because I just like to set the font size here to be 24. I'm also gonna to choose to bold this text. And then finally, we'll jump to our layout tab and once again, make this fully responsive. So we will unselect that this should be a fixed width. The minimum width will be zero. The maximum width will be infinite. We'll also set the minimum height to be zero. So that way it collapses around all of the text inside of it. And then finally, we'll vertically align this in the center of our red group. And lastly, we'll just add in 20 pixels of margin on the left. So that way it's not directly touching our Netflix logo. And look, that's everything we need to add into our first group here. So what I'm gonna do is select on the overall red group. I'll open up my layout tab and we can now set the minimum height here to be zero, which means it's going to collapse around all of the elements. Then while we're in our layout tab, I'm gonna scroll on down to my margins and just add in 20 pixels of margin at the top, 20 on the left and 20 on the right. And that will just ensure that this group does not touch the borders of my page. Now below this group, we're gonna add in yet another which if you remember in my existing bubble editor here, we had a search box as well as a button. And of course these are stacked horizontally across my page as well. So we're gonna need to add this group and set its container layout to be a row. So if we jump back to our main bubble editor, we're gonna scroll on down to our containers, grab another group here and add this in. Now, when it comes to this group, we're gonna open up our appearance tab and detach the default style of this, because as you saw, I'm gonna give this a flat background color and look, I'll make this a shade of green so that way it stands out and I can easily see where this sits on my page. We'll then jump to our layout tab and for the container layout, we can set this to be a row because as you just saw, we're gonna be stacking two elements in this horizontally, so side by side. We'll then also update the width settings. So to make this fully responsive, we'll unselect that this should be a fixed width. We'll set the minimum width to be zero, leave the maximum width as infinite, and of course, we'll come back and update the minimum height in a moment. But before we do that, I'd like to add both of my elements into this group. And the very first element is just going to be a standard input field that's going to act as a search box. So if I head down to my input forms, I'm gonna grab an input field here. I'll add this in. And before we make any changes to the styling or the layout of this input field, I'm just gonna update the name of this. I'm gonna call this input search because later on we're gonna build out an experience that allows us to filter through all of the content in our Netflix clone based on whatever someone types in here. And in fact, to prompt someone that they can actually type in here, I'm gonna update the placeholder text here to display the words search for content dot dot dot. Then after making changes to this, we will open up our layout tab here and look for the width of this input field. What I'd like to do is actually set this to be 280 pixels just so that way it's gonna give us a little bit of extra space to type something in. Now look, I'm also gonna leave the values for the width and the height as fixed values. So that means that at any given point in time, this input field will only be 280 pixels in width, which is of course this exact size that you see here. I don't want it to reduce or expand based on the size of the page. I always want it to be this width. I'll also then vertically align this in the center of my green group. And then beside this input field, we can add in a button, which of course is going to allow someone to create a new piece of content when they click it. So if we scroll on up to our visual elements, I'm gonna grab a button. I'll add this into my green group. And I'm just going to have this button display the words create content. And look, because this button is using our primary style, we don't need to make any changes to the styling of this. However, we will just need to expand the width because as you can see, both of our words are being stacked here. So if we jump to our layout tab, what I'm gonna do is update the width of this button to be 200 pixels. And I'm gonna leave this as a fixed value as well because I only ever want this button to be 200 pixels. I might also update the minimum height here to be 48 pixels. Now this isn't essential, but the reason I'm doing this is because if you remember, 
the height of our input field beside this was also 48 pixels. So if I just wanna create some sort of consistency, these will now be the exact same height. I will then choose to vertically align this in the center of my green group. And of course I need to position this button to the right hand side of my group. So in order to do that, what I can do is select on my overall green group and I can update the container alignment of this group. And if I choose the very last option, which is the space between option, it will just push both of my elements to the side of my group and add an even amount of space between them. And look, that's everything I need to add into this group. So what I'm gonna do is now open up my layout tab for this group and set the minimum height to be zero. That will of course collapse around both of my elements. And then finally, while I'm here, I'd also like to add in 20 pixels of margin at the top, 20 on the left, and then 20 on the right. And finally, below this group, there is one last section I'd like to add onto this page. And that is going to be the repeating group, which displays all of the content that we've uploaded to our Netflix clone. And look, thankfully, this repeating group is fairly straightforward to build out. So what we're gonna do is scroll on down to our containers menu, and we're gonna grab a repeating group. Now, like every repeating group, the first thing you'll need to do is update the data source for this. So if we jump to our appearance tab here, we can update the type of content that's going to be displayed inside of this repeating group to be the content data type. Because if you remember, whenever someone wants to upload a movie or a TV show, in our database, this is known as a piece of content. Then below this, when it comes to our data source, we're going to perform a search in our database for all of the content. But we're also gonna add one additional constraint to this. And that is that if someone has typed in a specific value into this search box here, I'd like to filter through all of this content and only display pieces of content where the title contains the same value that someone has typed in. So that way, instead of an admin or yourself having to scroll through a long list until you can find the specific show or movie that you wanna change, what you could do is instead just actually type the name of this in and then our repeating group would show only items that have that keyword in the name. So we're gonna open our search here and we're gonna add a constraint and we're only going to display pieces of content where the title contains keywords that have been typed into our input field. So if we scroll on down, we can reference our input search, its value. But one thing I should point out is that what happens if you come to this page and of course, by default, you're not gonna have anything typed into this input field here. So that means that this search right now would be null and void because right now it's searching for pieces of content where the title contains keywords that are in this input field. And of course, if there's no keywords in that input field, Bubble wouldn't return anything from this search. So you can see we've got a bit of a problem. The solution to this though is super straightforward. If we just check this box here to ignore empty constraints, what that just means is that when this input field is empty, it's going to ignore this whole constraint. So this will only be applied when someone actually types into this input field, which is the exact experience we wanna to create today. So it's super straightforward. And they're gonna to choose to close my data source. That's all we need to change for it. And now we can focus on the more complicated side of building out a repeating group, which is of course getting the design aspect correct. So when it comes to this repeating group, first of all, we're going to unselect that this should be a fixed number of rows because we don't obviously just wanna display four items, so four pieces of content. Instead, we wanna display as many or as few pieces of content that we have. So if we've only got one piece of content, we wanna show just one. And if we've got, let's say a thousand, we wanna show all 1000. So what we're gonna do is unselect that this should be a fixed number of rows. I am, however, gonna keep this as a fixed number of columns because I only want one piece of content to be shown on each individual line. So if we leave that fixed at one, that will help us create that experience. We're then gonna to need to jump to our layout tab and just quickly make this repeating group fully responsive before we can then jump in and build out all of the elements that will be positioned inside of it. So for this repeating group, we'll need to set the container layout here to be a row. And the reason for that is because if we were to jump over to my original bubble editor here, as you can see within this repeating group, we're displaying the thumbnail image of a piece of content, the title of it, its publish status, as well as then a button. And all of these elements are being positioned side by side. So they're scaled horizontally across our page. Then we're going to jump back into our main bubble editor and we're gonna update the width settings. We're gonna make this expand across the full width of our page. So we will unselect that this should be a fixed width. To make this fully responsive, we'll set the minimum width to be zero and leave the maximum width as infinite. 
Now look, we will come back and update the height and the margin settings, but before we do that, we need to build out all of the elements that are going to be positioned inside of this repeating group. So what we'll do is we will first of all, scroll on up to our visual elements, and we're gonna grab an image here. We'll add this into our repeating group cell. And when it comes to this image, we're gonna insert dynamic data. And as I mentioned before, we're going to display the thumbnail image for each piece of content. So I'll choose to insert dynamic data and I'm gonna reference the current cell's content. And if I scroll on down, I can reference its thumbnail image. And of course, because this is a dynamic image, I'm gonna also select this option to process this with MGIX. So that way I can tick this choice to resize and fit the dimensions by cropping them, which of course is just a personal preference of mine. It just means that the image is going to expand out and take up as much space as we give it. I'll then choose to close this here. And if we just scroll on down to our styling, I'm just going to detach the default style of this because while we're working on this image, I'm gonna give it a solid border. So that way, if I click away, I can easily see where this image sits on my page. I'm also then just going to update the roundness of this image's borders to be 10. So that way it has some nice curved edges. Then we can jump over into our layout tab. And when it comes to the width of this image, I'm gonna set this to be 150 pixels. And look, I'm gonna keep this as a fixed value because at any given point in time, I only ever want this image to be 150 pixels, no larger and no smaller. I'm also gonna check this option to keep this elements aspect ratio fixed and I'm gonna set this as a two to one ratio. So that way it becomes a perfect rectangle. Then finally, when it comes to the margins around this image, I'm just gonna add 10 pixels of margin at the top, 10 on the bottom and 10 on the left, but I won't add any on the right. Now beside this image, I'm just going to display some details about each piece of content. So if you saw in my original editor here, I have this red group. And the reason I have this is because inside of this, I'm stacking elements vertically, which means that I needed to set a container layout of a column. And inside of this group, I'm just displaying the title of this piece of content as well as its published status. And so what we'll do is jump back to our main bubble editor. I'm gonna grab a group. I'll add this into my repeating group. And as you saw, the first thing I'll need to do is just jump to my appearance tab, detach the default style of this and give this a flat background color. And I'm gonna set this to be a light shade of red. So that way, once again, I can see where this sits within my editor while I'm building my application. I'm then gonna to jump to my layout tab. And for the container layout, as I just mentioned, this is gonna to need to be a column because we're gonna be stacking elements vertically inside of this group. Finally, I'm then going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. We'll make this fully responsive. So we'll set the minimum width of zero and we'll leave the maximum width to infinite. But look, we will come back and update this in a moment. Before we do that though, I'm just interested in adding all of my elements that are going to be displayed inside of this group. So if we scroll that up, we're gonna to need to grab a text element. And when it comes to this text element, I'd like to display the title of this piece of content. However, when we go to insert dynamic data, what you'll see is that this text element doesn't actually sit inside of our repeating group. It actually sits inside of the red group, which in turn is positioned inside of the repeating group. And so because the text element doesn't directly sit inside of our repeating group, we can't reference the data of the current cells piece of content. So what we actually need to do is create some sort of way to pass the data from our repeating group into our red group, which can then pass it on to our text element. So to do this, we just need to select on the red group and for the data source, I can have this extract the current cells content. Then if I was to click on our text element, I can insert dynamic data and reference the parent group's content. And so the parent group is the actual red group. Because the text element sits inside of our group, the red group is kind of like the parent for this element. It's taking care of it. And so that's what bubble means by the parent group's content. And of course, because we're passing on the data from our repeating group to our red group, it now shares the exact same data as the repeating group itself. So for this text element, I'm gonna reference the parent group's content, the title of that piece of content. It's as simple as that. Now for this text element, I'm also gonna scroll on down and detach the default style here because I'd just like to update the font size to be 18. I'd also like to bold this so that way it stands out. And then we'll just need to make this fully responsive. So if we jump to my layout tab, I can unselect that this should be a fixed width. I will set the minimum width to be zero and leave the maximum width as infinite. We'll also then of course update the minimum height to be zero. And because we have this default option selected to fit the height of this element to the content within it, it's going to collapse nicely around that text. And then finally, I'm just gonna make a copy of this text element 
because as you saw previously, I just like to display the publish status of this piece of content. So if I jump to my appearance tab here, I'm gonna right click in this input field and just choose to clear all of this data because what I'm gonna do is just add in some static text that just displays the word published followed by a semicolon. Then from here, what I'm gonna do is insert dynamic data and I'm just gonna reference the published status of this piece of content. So if you remember within our database under our content data type, we had this data field known as is published and this was set to a yes, no value. So this field will either be yes or it will be no. And by default, it is no. Later on, we're gonna build out an experience which allows you to determine when a piece of content should be published. So when it's ready for your audience to view. But for the time being, within our design tab here, what I'm gonna do is insert dynamic data and I'm gonna reference the parent group's content, the is published status. And look, if I select this, this is either going to display yes or no. And that's all we need to add for the dynamic data here. I would just like to scroll on down to my styling and just update the font size here to be 14. And I'm going to unselect that this should be in bold. So that way this doesn't stand out as much as the title of this piece of content. I'll then jump over to my layout tab and I'm just gonna add in 10 pixels of margin at the top. So that way there's some space between these two elements. And then finally, I'm gonna select on my overall red group because at this point in time, I finished adding all of my elements I want into this group. So within my layout tab for this group, I'm now just gonna set the minimum height to be zero. And that's going to collapse around all of the elements that lie within it. Then from here, when it comes to the margins of this group, I'm just gonna add 10 pixels around the top, the bottom and the left-hand side of this. And something else I should just point out is that for this group here, as you can see, it takes up the entire width of our page. And that's because if we double click on our layout settings, it has an infinite maximum width. Whereas I personally don't think this group needs to be that wide. Because look, when you think about it, the title isn't going to be that long. It might be relatively short and only take up this amount of space here. And so what I'm actually gonna do on this group is give this a maximum width of 500 pixels. Now look, there's no specific reason why I selected 500. I just think that that's going to be more than enough space in order to display the title of a piece of content. Beside this though, what I'd like to do is add in the very last element for this repeating group, which is going to be the edit button. So under our visual elements, I'm gonna grab a button, I'll add this in, and I'm just going to have this display the word edit. I'll then jump over into my layout tab here because what I'd like to do is just update the width of this button to be 120 pixels. Because we're only displaying one word inside of this button, it doesn't need all of that width. But while we're here, what I'm also gonna do is just add 10 pixels of margin around every single border, because this is the very last element we're gonna add into our repeating group. And now after building out our repeating group, we can select on the repeating group itself and finish customizing the very last few settings. So when it comes to the layout here, what I'm gonna do is set the minimum height to now equal zero. And that's just going to collapse all of this empty space here. I'm also then just going to jump to my appearance tab. And one thing I've noticed that I should have actually pointed out earlier in this module, and I apologize for not doing this, is that when it comes to this repeating group, it's actually going to be a vertical scrolling repeating group. Unlike every other repeating group we've created so far, which was a horizontal scrolling repeating group. And if you remember from one of our very first modules, I mentioned that vertical scrolling repeating groups are much easier to create. And look, when I run a preview of this page later on after we create some content, you'll see what I mean. This is going to display a long list down our page, not across our page. But when you're building a vertical scrolling repeating group, after you've taken the time to add all of your elements inside of it, you'll need to come back to your appearance tab and just set the minimum height here to be zero. And once again, that's just going to collapse down around all of your elements. And so it's just going to ensure that there's no excess space at the bottom. But look, thankfully that's everything we need to change here. The only other thing I wanna do is just add some margin around this repeating group. So that way it doesn't touch the borders of my page or any other elements that sit above it. So if I jump to my layout tab, what I'm gonna do is just add in 20 pixels of margin at the top, 20 on the left and 20 on the right. And that is everything we need to configure when it comes to this repeating group. However, something I should point out is that we need to make sure that this whole page is going to be responsive on mobile devices. So if I jump over to my responsive tab, as you can see on a desktop, this page looks great. It expands exactly how I want it. However, as we start to reduce the width of our page here, as you'll see our red group in the middle will become quite squished. 
And if I continually reduce the width of my page, it just doesn't create a nice user experience. And another thing I can see is that when it comes to our red button here, it sits directly below our input field, which is fine. But as you can see, both of these elements are now touching. And so what we're going to do today is just make a few minor tweaks to make sure this page looks beautiful across both desktop and mobile devices. And look, the very first thing we'll do is just fix these two elements touching. So what I can do is just add in some margin for both of these elements. So if I was to double click on my input field, what I might actually do is just add in, let's say 10 pixels of margin at the top, and then I'll do the exact same thing for my button. So if I click on this and open up my layout tab, I'll add 10 pixels of margin here. Then what you'll see is that as we scroll and reduce the width of our page, both of these elements still do sit on top of each other, but there's a nice bit of space there now. Now you'll just need to remember that when it comes to actually previewing or publishing your app, you're most likely going to remove this background color. So you're actually not going to be able to see that margin at all. But for the time being, I'm just going to revert that change so that way we can easily see where this group lies on our page. Now, the other thing I want to address is this red group here. So as we're reducing the width of our page, this becomes quite squished. And the reason for that is because if I click on the group and open up my layout tab, this group has a minimum width of zero. So this just means that as the page collapses, this group can go to the smallest possible size, whereas that's actually not what I want to create today. And look, if you remember on the smallest possible mobile device size, which is 320 pixels, what I'd like is for all of these three elements to stack on top of each other and take up the entire width of this page at 320 pixels. And so what I need to do is ensure that the width here at its minimum or smallest possible size should cater to this 320 pixels on our page. But of course, it's not as simple as just adding 320 in here. Because of course, as you'll see on our repeating group, we have 20 pixels of margin on each side. And then when it comes to our red group, we also have 10 pixels of margin on our left hand side. And I'd also just like to add an extra 10 pixels of margin on the right. So that way this group doesn't touch the border of our repeating group on the right hand side as well. So if I quickly just scroll down to my layout tab, I'm going to add 10 pixels of margin here. And so it's at this point that we can do a little bit of quick math in order to determine what this exact minimum width should be. So if we've got 320 pixels in total and we take 20 plus 20, so if we take 40 pixels from 320, that leaves us with 280. And then if we have an extra 10 pixels on each side of this red group, that's an extra 20 pixels in total. So 280 minus an extra 20 is 260. So if we jump to our layout tab here, I'm going to set the minimum width of this group to be 260 pixels. And as you'll now see, that will create the exact experience we're looking for. So as this page expands out, this group of course has a maximum width of 500 pixels. So it will never go beyond this width. But as we reduce the width of our page, these elements are going to continually stack quite nicely. And look, this is what the final product is going to look like on a mobile device. And just like that, that is the very last thing I wanted to do when it comes to building out this dashboard page. Now look, unfortunately, I'm not going to run a preview of this page right now. If I was to do that, you wouldn't actually see anything because we don't have any content to display within our repeating group. After our next module though, however, where we actually learn how we can upload content to our Netflix clone, you'll definitely be able to see something within your repeating group. So I'm quite excited to show you that. For the time being though, we're just going to jump back into our Notion checklist and we're going to tick off that we've finished building out all of the features here to create our backend admin dashboard, which once again is just going to be a feature that only you as the admin of your Netflix clone will be able to have access to. As we scroll through the list of features within my checklist, I hope you're ready because this is going to be a huge module. And so is the module after that. Within this whole process, what we're going to do is learn how we can upload a piece of content to our Netflix clone. And look, this whole experience is quite complex, particularly if you are brand new to Bubble, which is why I've decided to break this down into two separate modules. Within this module right now, what we're going to do is learn how we can upload a movie. Now look, that process is relatively straightforward because when you think about it, when it comes to a movie, you're only uploading one file, which is the whole movie. Whereas when it comes to things like a TV series, you've got to not only create the TV series, but you've got to create the seasons. And then within each season, you've got to upload all of the episodes. So what I wanted to do first is break down the process of creating a simple experience. And in that experience, we're just going to upload a new movie. So what we're going to do is jump over into our bubble editor. 
And within this editor, we're going to create a brand new page. So if we open up our page drop down menu, we'll add a new page and we're going to call this the create page. Then from here, we can create this. Now, before we build out this page today, something I'd like to do first is just jump back to my dashboard page. So if you remember from our previous module, this was the page where an admin or yourself could view a list of all of the pieces of content that you've uploaded that your end users will be able to stream. And of course, on this page, we had a button here which just displayed the words create content. Now, when this button is clicked, what I'd like to do is run a workflow and send you through to that page where you can actually create a new movie. So we're gonna double click on this button here and we're gonna add a new workflow. And within this workflow, it is super straightforward. We're just going to select from a navigation event and choose the go to page action. And the destination page will be the new create page that we just added. Now, because this workflow is a navigation event, what I'm gonna do is select on the workflow trigger and update the event color here to be red. It's just a personal preference of mine. Then I'm gonna jump over to my create page and the first thing I'll need to do is just double click on the page and update the container layout. Now, like every other page we've created in our tutorial today, the container layout is going to be a column because we're gonna be stacking elements from top to bottom on our page. Now, similar to our dashboard page, the create page here is going to be a page that only you as the admin will view. So we don't need to add our navigation menu to the top of this page. And look, when it comes to this overall page, I should probably show you an example of what we're gonna to create today. So if I was to jump over into a separate bubble editor, this is the beginning of what we're gonna build. So on this page, the first thing I can see is that we just have this little menu section at the top here, which just tells us that we're an admin uploader. And then below this, we have a group element, which inside of this contains all of the inputs we need when we're creating a new piece of content. So we're gonna first of all select what type of content it is. Is it a movie or is it a TV show? We'll then add things like the title, the description, the thumbnail, the genres, the rating, and so on. And so what I wanna focus on building first is this group here. And of course, we'll need to also add in this section at the top of our page. Now look, thankfully, we can just copy this section at the top here from the page we'd previously built out. So if we jump back to our main bubble editor, I'm just gonna quickly jump back to my dashboard page select my red group and make a copy of this. We can then jump back to our create page and I'll paste that in. And just like that, that is already built for us. It's gonna save us a bit of time. Then below this, we're going to scroll on down to our containers menu and grab a group element. And when it comes to this group here, the first thing I'll do is just update the name of this to be called group overview, because this is where we're adding all of the overview details of a piece of content. And so if you remember, and perhaps I should just quickly digress and open up my data tab, if you remember in our database, we'd broken down each piece of content into a couple of different data types. In the actual content data type, we're storing all of the top level information about the piece of content itself. So this is things like the title, the rating, the thumbnail, and I guess you could say all of the metadata is the actual term for it, but we're not actually storing the files to stream this content. They all had their own individual data type. So there was the episodes, there was the movie content and there was the seasons. So all of these are separate, but all of these will link back to the actual main bit of content. So this is the overview of the actual piece of content. And once again, in my Netflix clone today, I'm just referring to a piece of content as either a TV show or a movie. You could say it's a piece of media, but whether it's a TV show or a movie, it's gonna fit under the same umbrella, which is a piece of content. So everything is going to share the same data type. And the reason I did that was just to simplify my database. I didn't wanna to have to have so many separate data types when it came to TV shows and movies. As you can see, I already have quite a few separate data types for their files. So I didn't wanna complicate things by adding in yet another data type for both the TV shows and the movies. So if we just jump back to our design tab, all we've done so far is updated the name of this group. I'm also just going to scroll on down to the style of this group and detach the default style. And I'm just going to add a solid border around this group. So that way when I click away, I can see where it sits on my page. While we're here, I'll also update the roundness of its borders to 10. So that way it has some curved edges. And then we'll need to make this group fully responsive. So I want this to expand across the full width of my page. 
So we're gonna jump to my layout tab. And when it comes to the container layout, as you saw in my example, all of the elements in this group are stacked down our page. So we're gonna set the container layout to be a column. We will then just unselect that this should be a fixed width. Like always, we'll set the minimum width to be zero, leave the maximum width is infinite. And look, we'll come back and update the height and the margin in a moment. But the very first element I'd like to add into this group is just going to be a title. So if we scroll on up to our visual elements, we can grab a text element and add this into our group. And when it comes to this text element, I'm gonna have this display the words, create new content. And for this text, because this is going to be a heading, I'm just going to detach the default style of this. I'll set the font size to be 20 and I'll also choose to bold this. I'll then jump over to my layout tab because I'd like to make this text fully responsive, which of course means that I'm just going to unselect that my width should be fixed. I will set the minimum width to zero, leave the maximum width is infinite. And for the minimum height, I'll also set that to be zero. So that way it collapses around all of the text inside of the element itself. Then finally, while we're here, I'm just gonna add 20 pixels of margin at the top, 20 on the left, and then 20 on the right. And that's just going to ensure that this text element won't touch the borders of my group it sits within. Then below this, I'm gonna add yet another heading element, which will just indicate what value you need to add into each individual input field. So that way it just creates a nice end user experience for you as the admin when you're uploading content to your Netflix clone. And so what we're gonna do is just make a copy of this existing text element, I'll then jump to my appearance tab and I'm gonna update this text by displaying the words, start by selecting a type of content. And by type of content, I mean, is this a TV show or is it a movie? Now for this text element, I'm going to update the font size here to be 14, not 20. So that way this is slightly smaller. And that is all we will need to change because we've already copied this from our original text element. All of the margins have been copied across and look, I'm quite happy with those as they are. Below this though, what I'd like to do is add a drop down menu, which will just allow you as the admin to select whether you wanna upload a TV show or a movie. So if I just scroll on down to my input forms, I'm gonna grab a drop down menu and I'll add this in. And the first thing I'll do is just update the title of this. And for this title, I'm just gonna call this drop down overview content type. Now, the reason I'm calling this the overview content type is of course, because we're selecting a content type within this drop down menu. But this drop down menu sits within my main group here, which is called the group overview. Now look, today we are gonna be adding a few different groups onto this page with different input fields that might potentially share the same name. So it's just important that you can easily differentiate between all of the different inputs within all of your different groups. I wanna try and simplify the entire process for us. Now for this drop down menu, I'm gonna display the two options, which is a TV show or a movie. But of course, if you remember in our database, under our option sets list, we had a content type which will just allow us to reference these two values here. So we've already created them. And so if we were to jump into our design tab, when it comes to a drop down menu, you can either add a list of static choices or you can reference a list of existing data within your database. And so today what I'm gonna do is update the choices style here to be a list of dynamic choices, which means we're gonna be pulling a list of options to select from, from our database. So when it comes to the type of choices, I'm gonna link this to my option set list, which is the content type. Then for all of the options that we should display within this drop-down menu, I'm just gonna reference all of the content types. So there's two in there, there's the TV show and the movie. I'm then also just going to update the caption. So this is the text that's actually going to display. So this will just allow you to display the text, TV show or a movie. So for the caption, this will be the current option, it's display text. Because if you remember in your option set, each word here is known as the display text. Now that's everything we need to configure here. What we will need to do though is just jump to our layout tab and make this element responsive. So I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'll set the minimum width to be zero. And look, what I'm also gonna do is just give this a maximum width because right now it's taking up quite a bit of space on my page. So for the maximum width, I'll set that to be 300. And look, there's no real specific reason why I selected 300. I just think that that's more than enough space. 
I'm also then just going to add in 20 pixels of margin on the left and 20 on the right. So that way it sits in line with all of my existing elements inside of my main group. Then below this input field, I'm gonna add yet another, and that's going to allow us to add in the title of this piece of content. So before I add that input field in, I'm just gonna make a copy of this text element, which is our small subheading, and I'm just going to update this to display the word title. Super straightforward. I'll then scroll to my input forms and grab a standard input form, and then I'm just going to update the name of this to be called input overview title. And look, that's all I'll need to change within our appearance tab here. We don't need to add any initial content yet, but I am just gonna jump to my layout tab and make this input field fully responsive as well. So similar to our drop down menu, I'm gonna unselect that this should be a fixed width, I'll set the minimum width to be zero. And when it comes to the maximum width, I'm gonna leave this as 600. So I'm gonna give us a little bit of extra space to work within. But when it comes to the height for this element, I'm also quite happy to leave this fixed at 48 pixels because I don't need this input field to expand down. It's just gonna have a couple of different words inside of it. I'm also then just going to add 20 pixels of margin on the left and 20 on the right. And then below this input field, we're gonna add yet another. So we're gonna select on our text element, make another copy, jump to our appearance tab, and we're gonna have this display the words short description. So as you probably guessed, this is where we're gonna add the description for this piece of content. Now, instead of adding just a standard input field, I'm gonna use the element below this, which is known as the multi-line input field. So as the name would suggest, a multi-line input field is just like a standard text input. However, it allows you to add in multiple lines of text, not just one. So this is great for when you're adding long form text content. So whether it be something like a description or a message, just because it doesn't cap how much your user can add into this field. Now a multi-line input field, as I mentioned, will just continually expand down as you add more text into it. But before we make any changes to this, we're just gonna need to update the title of this. So I'm gonna call this multi-line input overview description. And then from here, I'm gonna jump to my layout tab. I'll move this to the next position within my group. So that way it sits below the relevant heading. And when it comes to the dimensions, I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I will set the minimum width to be zero. And look for this input field, I'm gonna actually leave the maximum width as infinite because I do want this to take up the full width of my page. Because when you think about it, a description can be quite long. So I'm gonna give yourself or the admin plenty of space to add in all of the text that they need. I would just like to update the minimum height though and set this to be 48 pixels. And the reason for that is because that's the exact same height as all of my previous input fields. So it's gonna match that same setting. What you will notice though with a multi-line input field is that the maximum height is currently set as infinite. And that's the exact experience we need. Because as I mentioned, if someone starts typing in more text than what can fit in this input field, it will need to continually expand down. So with an infinite max height, it can push down as much as it needs in our page. I'll also just add 20 pixels of margin on the left and 20 on the right. And then below this, I'm gonna add a input field which allows us to add the publish date for this piece of content. So I'm just gonna select on my text element, make a copy, update this to display the word published year. And when it comes to this piece of data, I'm just gonna use a standard input field. So look, if I really wanted, I could even just select on my title input field, make a copy of that and just update the name of this. I'm gonna call this overview published year. I can see I just have a small typo there that I'll fix. And this field type is just going to be a text type, but I would just like to jump over to my layout tab because what I'm gonna do is just update the maximum width here to be 300 because I don't really need much space to add in a year. Then below this, we're gonna make another copy of our text element. We'll then open up our appearance tab and this is going to display the word thumbnail image. And of course, as you've guessed, this is where we're going to upload the thumbnail image that we'll display on our Netflix homepage. Now, if we wanna upload a picture, we'll need to jump to our input forms and select to add a picture uploader element into our group. And of course, before we make any changes to the layout of this input field, we're gonna open up the title here and we're going to change this. We're gonna call this picture uploader overview thumbnail. Then if we jump over into our layout tab, what I'm gonna do is make this fully responsive. So I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'll set the minimum width to be zero, but what I'm also gonna do is set the maximum width to be 300 pixels. Now, not only will that match the exact same width as our previous input fields above it, but if we have the height fixed at 150 pixels, 
Right now, this picture uploader is at a two to one ratio. So the width is twice the size of the height, which just creates that perfect rectangle for us. I'm also then just gonna move this to the next position within my group so it sits below the relevant heading and I'll add 20 pixels of margin on the left and 20 pixels of margin on the right. And then below this, we're gonna add yet another input field. So we're gonna need to copy our text element, jump to our appearance tab, and this is just going to display the word genres. Now, if you remember in our data tab here, under our option sets, we had a list of genres that you could choose from to help categorize pieces of content. And if we were to even look at our content data type here, for the data field, which is our genres, this was set as a list of genres, because when you think about it, a piece of content can have more than one genre. It could be comedy and it could be family at the same time. And so this is gonna to lead to a bit of a problem when it comes to our input fields. So in theory, what I'd personally like to do is add a drop down menu where you can select which genre from our list is relevant to this piece of content. However, the downside to a traditional drop down menu is that you can only choose from one option. Whereas as I just mentioned, we should be able to choose multiple different genres for one piece of content. And thankfully though, there is a quick fix to this. What we need to do is install a free plugin which allows us to select multiple options from a drop down menu. So if we open up our plugins tab here, I'm gonna to choose to add a new plugin and I'm just gonna type in the word multi. And from here, I'm just gonna install the multi select drop down plugin, which is a free plugin built by Bubble. I'll then choose to close my plugin library and jump back to my design tab. And if you scroll on down to your input forms, and if I just move my head out of the way, you'll now see a new input field known as the multi drop down. Then if you add this into your editor, We'll just need to configure a few settings because similar to our first dropdown, what I wanna do is display a list of dynamic data from my database. So I wanna display a list of all of my genres that I've already created within my option set list. And so in order to do that, what we need to do is select that the choices style here should be a list of dynamic choices. Then of course, we need to identify from our database, which data do we wanna display? And this of course is going to be from my option sets and this will be my genres. Then for all of the data we should display within this field, I'm gonna select all of the genres. So that means that you can just choose from any genre on that list. You're not restricted from selecting a particular one. And then finally for the caption of each option, this will just be the current options display text, which is the actual name of the genre itself. Then from here, before I jump into my layout tab, I realized that I should have actually taken the time to update the name of this input field first. And for the title of this, I'm gonna call this multi dropdown overview genres. And now we can jump to our layout tab, move this to the next position within our group. And for this input field, I'm also going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'll set the minimum width to be zero, but I'm actually gonna leave the maximum width at 600 pixels. Because when you think about it, if you've got quite a few genres, you could choose from a number of different options. And the way a multi dropdown menu works is that when you select each option, it stores a little tag within the input field. And perhaps I could actually just quickly run a preview of this and show you how this is going to work. So within a standard drop down menu, if you were to select an option, it just stores that as text. However, within a multi drop down menu, if I was to select an option here, it stores it as a tag. And then if I was to select another option, it would add another tag into this input field. So if you've got a long list of tags, I wanna add more than enough space that you need in order to choose all of those. I'm just gonna close this preview for now though, because what I'd also like to do is just update the minimum height. I'm gonna set this to be 48 pixels, which is the same height as all of my other input fields. And then finally, I'll just add 20 pixels of margin on the left and 20 pixels of margin on the right. And look, we're almost there for all of our main input fields. There's two more to go. The next one is going to allow us to select the rating for this movie. So is it PG, G, M, or R? And what we're gonna do first is just copy this text element. I'll update this to display the word rating. Then what I'll need to do is add in a standard dropdown menu because when it comes to a rating, you can only choose one rating. So in order to streamline that process, I'm actually gonna select on our first dropdown menu and make a copy of that. And look, I can also see that at this point in time, we're starting to run out of space on our page. So if I select on the overall page itself, so this is the create element, I'm gonna jump to my layout tab and I'm just gonna set the minimum height here to be something like 1500 pixels. So that way it just gives me more room to work with. Now look, when you go to preview or publish your app, you can always update this. But for the time being, I just need a little extra room to breathe. So I'm gonna add that in. I'm then just gonna select on my new dropdown menu here and I'm gonna update the name of this I'm gonna call this drop down overview 
rating. Then when it comes to all of the layout settings, because we've already copied this from our previous dropdown, we don't need to make any changes here. The only thing we will need to change is the data source. So at this point in time, this dropdown menu is displaying our list of the different content types, so the movie or the TV show. Whereas in my database, under my option sets, I'd also created a separate option set list for our ratings. And so I wanna display this list. So if I jump to my design tab here, I'm just gonna update the type of choices here to be a rating. Then for all of the choices, I'm gonna display all of my ratings. And then for the caption, I'll just display the display text. I don't need to change that. Then there is one very last input field we need to add. So I'm just gonna make a copy of our text element and I'm gonna update this to display the word published. And when it comes to this input field, I just want this to be a simple checkbox. So if you've checked this box, this piece of content should be published. And if it's unchecked, it should not be visible to anyone within your Netflix clone. So what we're gonna do is head to our input forms. I'm gonna grab a standard checkbox here. I'll add this into my group and I'm gonna update the name of this to be called checkbox overview published status. Then when you're working with a checkbox, you just need to give this a label. And I'm just gonna say yes. So when this is checked, that means that yes, it is published. And look, by default, I'm gonna leave this unchecked. That's all we need to change. I would just like to jump to my layout tab though and make this fully responsive. So I will unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'll set the minimum width to be zero. I can leave the maximum width as infinite because as you see, it's just displaying a checkbox and some text. Then I'm just gonna add 20 pixels of margin on the left, 20 on the right, and I'll move this to the last position within my main group here. And look, that is the end of the input fields we need to add into our first group. So below this, I'm gonna add in a button element, which when clicked is going to run a workflow that will create a new piece of content in our database using all of this information that we've just added for these input fields. So I'm gonna scroll on up to my visual elements. I'll grab a button, I'll add this into my group, and this button's just going to display the word create. I'll then jump to my layout tab and move this to the last position within my group. And look for this button, I'm quite happy to leave it as the default size it is. So it's 150 pixels and that's a fixed width. So it will always be this size. But because this is the very last element in my group, I just wanna add in 20 pixels of margin at the top, 20 on the bottom, 20 on the left, and then 20 on the right. And finally, we can then select on our group here. So this is our group overview. And if we open up our layout tab, we can now update the minimum height to be zero just to ensure that it's going to collapse around all of the elements inside of it. And while we're here, I'm also gonna add 20 pixels of margin at the top, 20 on the left and 20 on the right. And that will just ensure that this group doesn't touch the borders of my actual page. Now, after building out this first group, I wanna build out yet another group. And perhaps the best way to illustrate what we're gonna create is by showing you an example in a previous bubble editor that I've already worked on. So this is our upload page here. And as you can see, we've got the group that we've just created in our main bubble editor. But over in my elements tree here, I have a group known as the group movie. So once we've taken the time to upload all of the main details about a piece of content or all of the metadata, so it's title, it's thumbnail, it's description and so on. What I'd like to then do is hide our first group and then display this second group, which is a super basic group. And the purpose of this group is to just upload the actual file of your movie into this. And so that's exactly what we're gonna create now. If we jump back to our main bubble editor, in order to streamline this whole process, I'm gonna make a copy of my existing group here. So I'm gonna select on this, hit Command C, I'll scroll on down, I'll select on my page and paste in another version of this group. But the first thing I'll need to do for this group is double click on it, open up my property editor, and I'm just gonna change the name of this. So this is now my group movie. So that way over in my elements tree, I can see all of my different groups and they're clearly labeled so I can easily tell them apart. Now, when it comes to our second group here, we don't need all of these input fields. So we're gonna delete them all. So what I'm gonna do is select on our drop down menu downwards and just delete all of these fields. So I'm just going to hold shift as I select all of these items here. I'll scroll on down, grab the rest of these. And now I'll choose to delete all of those. Now, as you can see, all I've left is just the main title, a subheading and our button here. And so the first thing I'll change is our main title. I'm gonna have this display the words upload movie file. And then for our subheading, I'm just gonna have this display the words media file. 
because below this, I'd like to add an input field, which allows us to actually upload a file. So if I scroll on down to my input forms, right at the bottom, you're gonna see the option to add in a file uploader. And this does exactly as the name would suggest. It just allows you to upload any type of file and it's gonna store that within Bubbles database. And so before I make any changes to this input field, I'm just going to update the name. I'm gonna call this file uploader movie file. Now, when it comes to this input field, when you upload a file into it, it's actually not really gonna show much. Inside of this input field, it's just going to display the name of the file. It's not like it's gonna run a preview of the movie as soon as you upload it. So you don't really need to make this input field pretty. And once again, this whole admin dashboard is to just simplify the process for you as an admin of uploading content. So it doesn't really need to look like a beautiful user experience because I think that we can just tolerate something making our life easier on the back end. So when it comes to the layout settings for this input field, what I'm gonna do is just keep this as a fixed value of 200 pixels, but I'm just gonna set the height here to be 100 pixels. So that way it is a two to one aspect ratio. So the width is twice as long as the height. And so that's just going to make it a nice rectangle. I'll also just add 20 pixels of margin on the left and 20 on the right. So it sits in line with all of my other elements in this group. But the other thing I'll need to do is jump over into my appearance tab here, because by default, something I need to point out is that at this point in time, if you're using Bubble, you need to understand some of the configurations for storing files. Now, I just wanted to take a moment to talk about this in more detail, just because when it comes to uploading files, files are quite large for applications to run and process. So you need to make sure you do everything correctly in order to create a smooth end user experience. And look, within our appearance tab here, you might notice that by default, when it comes to this file uploader, the file size is capped at 50 megabytes. And look, 50 megabytes isn't much at all. But thankfully, Bubble allows you to upload files up to five gigabytes, which is more than enough for a movie. But what you need to do is just take the time to type in the number 5,000 here. So 5,000 megabytes is five gigabytes. And if you don't do this, what you'll find is that you'll go to upload your movie and Bubble tells you that you can't do it because the file is too large. So please just take the time to do this right now. Now, another thing I should talk about is the process of actually streaming a movie today. So within my Netflix clone, Everything we're building out today is gonna to be natively created inside of Bubble. And what I mean by that is that we're going to upload our own video files and store them in our own Bubble database. And then we're going to stream those videos using a Bubble plugin. And that is going to be a free plugin. But like everything in Bubble, there's more than one way to do things. If you didn't wanna store your movie files directly within your Bubble database, you can choose to store these on an external service. So there's tools like Xeno, which are great for this which if you wanted to check that out, it's X-A-N-O. It's just like an external database that you can connect to Bubble. And because all they do is build databases, they just focus on making things really fast and scalable. But that's one option. Another option is that you can use a tool like Zigio. So if you're not familiar, you can open up your plugins library and search for a tool called Zigio, which is Z-I-G-G-E-O. And Zigio is a third party service which allows you to upload videos and store it on someone else's cloud, which you can then stream back into your Bubble app. So once again, it's doing all the heavy lifting for you and storing all of those large movie files on an external service. Now, by all means, today we're gonna to be able to store and stream our own movie files just fine in Bubble, but I think I'd be doing you an injustice if I didn't take the time to talk about these additional services. And look, if you really wanted to still look at alternative options, you could always check out the Bubble Community Forum. There's plenty of great posts there that talk about movie streaming. For now though, what I'm gonna do is jump back into my design tab because what I wanna do is now build out the workflows that are going to run in order to power the process of creating a new piece of content. So what we're gonna do is head on up to our main group here. And after you've taken the time to add all of the information about a piece of content, you're gonna click this button and what we're gonna do is add a new workflow. Now within this workflow, we're gonna do a couple of different things. And the very first thing is that we're gonna create a new piece of content within our database. And so if we select an action here and head to our data tab, we can choose to create a new thing in our database. And that type of thing we're gonna create is a new piece of content. Then from here, all we'll need to do is match all of the relevant data fields in our database with the input fields on our page. So I'm gonna to select to add all of my input fields here, and then we just need to work our way through this list. And I'll explain everything you need to create throughout this process. So for the content type for this piece of content, I'm gonna have this reference the value of our dropdown overview content type. 
And once again, this is the importance of adding naming conventions to all of your input fields. It just simplifies the process of building out a workflow. Then for the description, this is going to be the value of our multi-line input overview description. For the genres, I'm going to add a list of all of the genres selected from our multi dropdown menu. So this is our multi dropdown overview genres. Then for the is published status, I'd like this to reference the value of our checkbox. So our checkbox overview publish status, and if it is checked, this will be updated. Then when it comes to our movie file, we haven't yet taken the time to upload that file in our file uploader. So this field is not relevant at this point in time. So what I'm gonna do is choose to delete this. For the published year though, if I just type in the word year, I can reference the input overview published year, its value. For the rating, I'm gonna type in the word dropdown because I know that we can reference the dropdown overview rating. Then when it comes to our thumbnail image, this will be stored in our picture uploader. So the picture uploader overview thumbnail. For the title, this is going to be the title field, the input overview title, its value, and then look for the TV seasons. We don't yet need this field as well because we haven't taken the time to upload any TV seasons. So I'm gonna to choose to delete this here. And now after creating a brand new piece of content in our database, what I'm gonna do is jump back to my design tab here, and I'd like to create a way to hide this first group and then display this second group here. So that way we can upload a movie file. And of course, something I should point out is that by default, this second group is actually being displayed on our page. Whereas I want it to be hidden when the page is loaded and only shown when someone clicks this button and creates a new piece of content. And so what we're gonna do is make a few minor tweaks to this group. The first thing we'll do is jump to our layout tab and we're going to unselect that this group should be visible on page load. We're also then going to select to collapse this group when it's hidden. So that way it doesn't take up any empty space on our page. And then finally, if we really wanted, we could choose to animate the collapse operation for this group. And I might choose to fade this in and out. So that way when this group is displayed, it just fades in nicely and creates a nice user experience. The other thing I'm gonna do for this group, which I'd forgotten to do, is just update the text displayed within this red button. So under our appearance tab, I'm just gonna have this display the word upload. And because this button's gonna be used to trigger a workflow later on, I'm just gonna be very clear in my title here what this button is for. So this is going to be my button movie upload. And perhaps I should do the exact same thing for my original button here. So I'm gonna update the title to be called button overview create. So now I know that when I look in my workflow editor, I know that the workflow for my button overview create is related to this step here. Now the other thing we'll need to do if we're going to hide this group and display our second group is just make sure that our first group here doesn't take up any empty space on our page when it's not being shown. So if I select on my first group, so my group overview, I'm gonna select my layout tab. And although this element will be visible on page load, I'm gonna tick this option here to collapse it when it's hidden. So that way it doesn't take up any empty space. And I'm also gonna to choose to collapse the animation operation and I'll make sure that this fades in and out as well. And so what we need to do right now is create an experience in our workflow that, as I mentioned, hides this first group and then displays our second group. So I'm gonna jump into my workflow tab here. And within this workflow, I'm going to add an additional step here. And if I head to my element actions, I'm gonna to choose to first of all hide an element. And that element will be my group overview. Then I'm gonna add an additional step and I'm gonna to choose to now show an element and that element will be my group movie. And now something I just wanna do while we're here is actually add a condition onto this specific workflow step. So if I was to jump to my design tab, and let's say if I was to create a new piece of content and I select that the content type is actually a TV show, I obviously don't want this second group being displayed, which is gonna prompt me to upload a movie file. Instead, later on throughout our next module, we're gonna create another group which is going to allow us to create a TV series. So we're gonna add seasons and episodes. And so I only want this group being shown if the value in this drop-down menu is in fact selected as a movie. I'll then want this to be shown. So in my workflow editor, I'm gonna add a condition onto this specific workflow step here. Not the entire workflow, but just this workflow step. And I'm gonna recognize that this step in our workflow should only run when the drop-down content type, when its value is in fact a movie. So I'm gonna select is a movie. 
and now it will show that second group. And look now, another thing I should point out is that if I run a preview of this page, and let's say I add in all of my details about this piece of content, and I click this create button, and first of all, I should say that we're creating a movie here. This group is gonna be hidden and it will display our second group, but I just wanna make sure we scroll to the top of my page. So that way we're not in some sort of scenario where although that group is hidden and we're currently at this section of our page, that it doesn't automatically scroll back. And look, I did just notice that it automatically did scroll us back to the top of our page, but sometimes Bubble doesn't. So I just wanna cater for that. So what I'm gonna do within my workflow editor is just add one additional step into my workflow. And if you just type in the word scroll, we're gonna to choose to scroll to an element. And if I select that the element is my create page, it's just gonna scroll back to the top of our page. So that way our eyesight can be in line with this particular group here. And look, that's everything we needed to build out for that workflow for the time being. If we were to just jump back into Bubble, however, I'd like to build out the workflow that now runs whenever this upload button is clicked. So if someone is creating a movie, I wanna be able to upload this movie file and link it back to that movie. So what we're gonna do is add a new workflow whenever this button is clicked. And within this workflow, we're gonna do a couple of things. The first thing we're gonna do is create a new movie file in our database. So if you remember, under our data types, we had a data type known as the movie content. So this is where we're storing those larger files. We're separating it from our main content data type. So that way it doesn't automatically load this movie file every single time we wanna display the details of a movie. That would easily just slow our application down. And of course, within this data type, we just had one data field, which was a file. So what I wanna do within this workflow is create a new thing, and I'm going to create a piece of movie content. And the data field I'm just going to create is going to be a file. And then I'm going to set this value here to be the file uploader movie file. It truly is as simple as that. Now, something I should point out is that when you're uploading a movie file, because these are quite large files, it's gonna take a little bit of time to do that. It's not gonna be instant. Because when you think about it, if you've ever uploaded the video to something like YouTube, it can often take hours to do. So please expect that exact same user experience. If you're uploading a very long movie, it will take a couple of hours to upload. And of course that's dependent on things like your internet speed and your device, but please don't expect it to be instant. Even on the best products in the world, uploading movie files is never instant. Now the other thing I'll need to point out is that at this point in time, we've uploaded a movie file, but because this movie content data type is separate from our main content data type, these two things aren't connected yet. So we need to create that connection so that we know when we wanna stream a particular content, we can reference a specific file that belongs to it. And if you remember, in our database, we had a data field under our content data type, which was known as our movie file. And this is just going to create a connection between these two data types. So what we need to do is make changes to a piece of content and link that to the new movie content data type we've just created. So if we jump to our workflow editor, we're gonna to head to our data tab and we're gonna make changes to a thing. And now this is where you're gonna see a bit of a curveball come into the mix. What we wanna do is we wanna make changes to the movie we've just created in the very first piece of content. So this was our first workflow we created. But because these two workflows are disconnected, we can't actually reference this piece of content that we've just created. So how can we do that? What we need to do is create some sort of way to reference the piece of content that was just created on our page. And thankfully, Bubble has a feature that allows you to do just that. In Bubble, there's a feature known as custom states. And custom states, to put things simply, just allow you to store information and data directly in your page. So unlike a database where you store data in a database and that data permanently sits there, a custom state just allows you to temporarily store information in your page. Now, why would you wanna do that? Custom states are perfect for use cases like this. So let's say if we came to this page and we took the time to create a new piece of content and it was gonna be a movie. What I'd then like to do is just temporarily store that movie on my page. So that way I know that when I upload a new movie, I can reference that movie that's been stored in my page and I can then link this media file 
to that movie. And the main benefit to using a custom state is that that information isn't going to be stored in your database. So if you're temporarily storing something on your page, it's not gonna create unnecessary clutter in your database by storing additional information that you don't need or duplicate information for that matter. And look, I know this still sounds quite confusing and please don't be overwhelmed if you are brand new to Bubble. Custom states are a bit more of an intermediate feature, but it's an essential feature nonetheless for this use case. And I'm gonna be sure to explain it in as much detail as I can as we walk through the process. So if I was to double click on my overall page, so this is my create element. Bubble has this cheeky little backdoor menu, which not many people know about from the beginning. If you were to click this information icon, it's gonna open up what I like to refer to as the wardrobe to Narnia. This truly will expand the capabilities of your app. So within this menu, which is known as the element inspector, as you can see, it gives you the ability to create what's known as a new custom state. And if I was to click on this, what you'll notice is that this looks familiar to the process of creating a new data field in your database. And that's because we essentially are creating a data field, but this data field is only going to be stored on our page, not in our database. And so what I wanna do is create a new custom state and I'm gonna call this the editing content. And if I set this state type to be a piece of content, what I'm gonna do is after I create a new piece of content, I'm gonna store it as the editing content, which means that I'm currently editing that one piece of content. Now you can call this custom state whatever you want, but this is just what I'm gonna call mine, but it must be set as the content data type because you're storing a piece of content in your page temporarily. And what I mean by temporarily is that if you were to ever refresh your page, it would clear that custom state. And that's the difference between a custom state and storing information in your database. Every single time you refresh your page, your database doesn't refresh itself. It's always there. Whereas with a custom state, if you refresh the page, you lose that information. And that's the benefit to this. It only temporarily stores information that you need for a brief period of time. So look, I'm gonna create this custom state here. Then what I need to do is create a workflow which is going to store a particular piece of content in my database. And then when I go to reference or link this movie file to a piece of content, I know that it is the piece of content stored in my custom state. So if I open up my workflow tab, I'm gonna select on the very first workflow we created, which is the workflow that runs when the button overview create is clicked. And of course, within this workflow, we created a new piece of content, we had hidden a group, we displayed our second group, and then we scrolled to the top of the page. So what I'd now like to do is just add an additional step and type in the word state, and I'm gonna set the state of an element. And this element is going to be our overall create page. And as you'll see, we now have the ability to reference the editing content custom state. And inside of this, we need to store the value of a particular piece of content. And that piece of content is going to be the piece of content I created in step one of my workflow. And this is a superpower of bubble here. What you'll see is that I have the ability to reference the result of step one. So the new piece of content that I created, and because that data type is content, and the type of thing I'm storing in my page is also a piece of content, it's easily going to allow me to store that information in my page, which if that information is stored in my page, I can access it at any given point in time. Now look, when it comes to this workflow step, I'm also gonna move this up to step two in my workflow. So I wanna set this state before I hide and display my second group. Then I'm going to open up my second workflow. So this is the workflow here where we had uploaded a movie file. And after we create this movie file, when we need to link it to a piece of content, what we can now do is reference the create page, the editing content. So this is the piece of content stored within our page. And because we've set the custom state, which means that we've just stored a piece of data in the page, I can now reference that one piece of content and I have access to change any of these data fields within that one data type. And the field I wanna change is the movie file, which if you remember in our database here, the movie file was linked to our movie content data type. And if I want to store a movie file here, it's gonna be the result of step one in this workflow, because in this workflow, I've already created a piece of movie content, and I'm now going to link that to this field here. Now look, after a movie file has been uploaded, I just wanna to confirm to the user that that has been successfully uploaded. So a way I can do that is just by temporarily displaying an alert message on my page. So if I scroll on up to my visual elements, I'm gonna grab an alert message, 
I'll add this at the bottom of my page. It doesn't really matter because I'm gonna click this option to position this at the top of my page. And within this alert message, I'm just gonna have this display the words upload successful. And then I'm gonna jump to my layout tab and just have this take up the full width of my page. So what I'm gonna do is unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'll set the minimum width to be zero and leave the maximum width as infinite. And if you remember, alert messages are hidden on your page. They're only temporarily displayed whenever you reference them within a workflow. So if I head to my workflow tab here, I'm gonna add an additional step into this workflow and I'm gonna to head to my element actions and I'm gonna to choose to show a message. And that alert message will be the only alert on my page, which is the alert upload successful. Now that is everything I need to build out when it comes to these two workflows. What I would like to do though, is just color code these workflows because this workflow here is related to the process of uploading a movie file. What I'm gonna do is click on the workflow trigger itself and set this event color to be blue. So that way I know that if there's any blue workflows on this page, it's related to uploading a movie file, as I just mentioned. And then I'm gonna click on my initial workflow and I'm gonna set this to be the green color. So that way I know that if there's any green workflows, they're related to the process of creating the overview of a piece of content. And look, at this point in time, we've pretty much finished the process of building out the feature to upload a new movie at this point. But before we take a preview of this, there is just a few additional bits of housekeeping I wanted to take care of. On this page here, you should only be able to access this if your account type is an admin. So if you remember in our database under our user data type, we had a data field known as the profile type and you could either be a user or an admin. And look, by default, everyone is a user. But I imagine if you're going to create your own account, you would wanna set this as an admin in your database. And so what I wanna do on this page is just create a workflow that runs every single time this page is loaded. And when this page is loaded, if your account type is not an admin, you should not be able to access this. So I'm gonna redirect you back to my home page. So if I open up my workflow tab, I'm gonna create a brand new workflow from scratch, and I'm gonna have this run whenever the page is loaded. But I'm gonna add a condition on this workflow, and I'm only going to allow it to run when the current user, when their profile type is in fact just a user. So when they're not an admin, what I'm gonna do is send them back to our home page. So I'm gonna select from the navigation event, I'll choose the go to page action, and I'm going to send them back to our index page. Now look, another thing I realized is that this is a workflow that we should have on our dashboard page as well. So if I open up my page drop down menu and select my dashboard page, you might remember that on this page, we were displaying a bit of an admin dashboard where someone can view a list of all of the pieces of content that you've uploaded. And look, because only you as the admin should be able to see this page, what I'm gonna do is build out the exact same workflow. So I'm gonna create a new workflow from scratch I'll have this run when the page is loaded. And within this, I'll add a condition that only allows this to run when the current user, when their profile type is in fact a user, not an admin. So if you're an admin, this workflow will not affect you. What I'm gonna do then is select from a navigation event, choose the go to page action, and the destination page will be the index page, which is of course our home page. And right before we wrap this module up, there's one last thing I wanna add onto my create page, and that is a way to actually get back to the dashboard page. So of course, if you remember, when someone clicked a button on our dashboard page, they were sent to this page. And then of course, you can take the time to upload all of the content as well as a movie file, but we're gonna need some sort of way to get back to the dashboard page. So what I'm gonna do below all of my group elements is just add in a button. So if I open up my movie group here, I'm gonna add a button below this at the bottom of my page, which when clicked, will just send someone back through to the dashboard. So I'm gonna grab a visual element and I'm gonna select a button. I'll add this onto my page. And if I open up my layout tab, I can move this to the last position on my page. And look, when it comes to this button, I'm just gonna have this display the word save. So this is gonna kind of create the illusion that when you click this, it's gonna save all your changes and then send you back through to the dashboard page, even though it's not really gonna save any changes because we've already done that within our existing workflows. What I'll also do is just jump to my layout tab and I'm going to add 20 pixels of margin around each border here, except for the bottom. And look, when it comes to this button, I actually don't want this to be displayed by default. I only want it to be displayed after you've taken the time to already create a piece of content. So when you land on this page and you need to create a new piece of content, I want all your focus to be on this. It's only when you've taken the time to upload a movie file that I then want you to be able to click this button. 
So what I'm gonna do is unselect that this element should be visible on my page. And I'm also gonna choose to collapse this element when it's hidden. So that way it doesn't take up any empty space. But now what I'll need to do is create some sort of condition and a way to recognize when this button should be shown. And thankfully, I have a great idea of how we can do that. If we obviously only want this button to be displayed whenever someone's uploading a movie file, at that point in time, a user would have already created a piece of content and that would have been stored in our custom state on the page. So what I could do is head to my conditional tab for this button and I could define a condition and just recognize when that custom state is not empty, meaning it has a value stored in it, this button should then be visible. So what I'm gonna do is reference the create page. So if I type in the word create, I can select from the overall page and I'm gonna recognize when the editing content custom state and if I scroll on down, I can select this option that is known as is not empty. So when a user has already taken the time to create a piece of content and it is now being stored in the custom state on our page, what I'm gonna do is select that this element should be visible and I will tick that that should be true. Now the other thing we'll need to do for this button is build out a workflow that's gonna send someone through to our dashboard page whenever it's clicked. And this is the very last thing we'll need to do on this page. So if we head to our appearance tab, we can choose to add a new workflow. And within this workflow here, I'll select from a navigation event choose the go to page action and the destination page will be our dashboard page. And because this is a navigation event, I'm gonna select on my workflow trigger and update the event color here to be red, just so that way I can easily tell it apart from all of my existing workflows. And just like that, that wraps up absolutely everything I wanted to cover within this section of our module. I really wasn't lying when I said at the beginning of this module that this was going to be a big one. There were so many things I had to cover within this process. And look, I completely understand that if you're brand new to Bubble, some things like the custom states and building out those complex workflows might be a little bit overwhelming. So if you did find yourself getting lost, I'd always recommend taking the time to pause the tutorial and rewatch any of the sections that I've covered. But if you're still with me at this point, Let's now run a preview of our page and we can see what this entire process is going to look like. And in order to run a preview of this page, what I'm first gonna need to do is jump over into my data tab, open up my app data and select on all of my users. Because if you remember, when I signed up an account before, by default, my profile type is a user, whereas I need to make myself an admin. So what I'm gonna do is edit the permission on my account. So if I select the little pencil icon, I can come up here and set my profile type to now be an admin. I can choose to save this. And then from here, I can choose to run a preview of this page logged in as that user. And from here, I can add in all of the details about the new piece of content I wanna create. So within this scenario, I'm gonna create a new movie. I'm gonna call this Daddy's Home. And when it comes to the description, I don't really wanna type one out myself. So I'm just gonna grab some dummy text. So if you type in the word lorem ipsum, generator you can go to this website and you can just copy across some dummy text here i'm just going to grab let's say this first sentence i will then paste this into my multi-line input field for the published year uh, i can't really remember when this came out but i'm just going to say 2014 for the thumbnail image i'm going to upload a custom thumbnail image i have on my own device once that's then uploaded, I'm gonna select my genres. I'm gonna say this is comedy as well as family. For the rating, I'll say that this is PG. And for the published status, I'm not gonna check that that should be true because of course at this point in time, I haven't yet uploaded the movie file itself. I'm then gonna to choose to create this here. It's going to run that workflow. And not only will it create a new piece of content in my database, but it's going to store the custom state in my page, which is saving that piece of content. Then I'll have the ability to upload a media file. So I'm gonna do this from my local device. Now, as I mentioned before, if you're uploading a long video, this will take time to do. And so when I do this now, I'm just gonna fast forward ahead to save you the time of having to watch this upload. Once my file has finished uploading, I'm then going to select my save button here. And that is of course going to link this file to the actual content itself as well as then redirect me back to my admin dashboard. So as you'll see, when I click this, my workflow runs, I'm redirected back to my page, and I can now see that my daddy's home movie is now being displayed within my repeating group. 
And that concludes everything we're gonna cover within this section of our build. So we're gonna jump back into our Notion checklist and tick off that we've finally finished creating the feature which allows us to upload a piece of content, in particular, a piece of content that is a movie. And look, as I mentioned, I've split this down into two separate modules because as you've seen so far, the process of creating a movie was actually quite complex, but just you wait until you see the process of creating a TV show. And that is all I have time to include within this tutorial today. As you can see, we've been building for hours and there's still so many features that I need to uncover in as much detail as possible. Now, if you wanted to get access to the entire Netflix clone course, I'd always recommend hitting that link in the description of this video. So that way you can go and purchase the course from my website. Now, while that course is going to cost you money, I'm confident that it's gonna save you months of your life having to learn how to rebuild every single feature from scratch. So if you're looking to launch your startup as quickly as possible, I definitely recommend checking it out. Throughout that full course, there's still so many features that I need to walk through. So we need to be able to create a dashboard for admins to be able to upload new content. Of course, then also go on to edit the details of any existing content. We need to also build out the feature that allows us to preview the details of any show or movie within a pop-up, create a custom search feature, build out dedicated library pages for all of our TV shows and movies, creating a custom bookmarking feature, and of course, go on to build out the feature to actually stream a piece of content itself. So there's still quite a bit that we need to cover. Now, if you also wanted to stay up to date with any additional bubble resources I share, I'd always recommend hitting that subscribe button on my channel, so that way you can be the first to know whenever I drop a new video. In the meantime though, I just wanted to say a massive thank you for taking the time to watch this tutorial, and I wish you all of the best on your own no-code journey.